Um, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody back to the second day of this incredible workshop. Uh, yesterday, we learned about the impact of the contingency rule on stakeholders that led up to this event. And we also heard from a distinguished panel of experts who shared their unique perspectives on the contingency planning process as it applies to different types of organizations and systems. Today, we'll be hearing from another excellent panel and learning how individuals with different roles and responsibilities in the animal program participate or can contribute to contingency planning. And then this afternoon, we'll be learning more about training the responders who uh, participate in contingency planning. Um, and this has been identified as one of the leading challenges that stakeholders face. So we're all looking forward to hearing that information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Fiella, who is going to be moderating our first session. Thank you, Susan. As she said, we're going to look at the different roles in contingency planning. Um, first up will be Dr. Tracy Heenan. She's the director of the Office of Animal Care and Use and a professor at the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Animal Laboratory Medicine at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Tracy? Good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending this session. And I'm going to be covering IACUC roles and responsibilities and um, how they fit in with the contingency plan. Next slide. Whoops. So today, going to cover a few topics. Uh, first, where does the IACUC fit in the contingency planning process? And what did the IACUC and the IACUC office bring to the process? Challenges that uh, IACUC's involvement in the contingency planning might, um, might bring about, and how IACUC's responsibilities have been changed by the rule. And then finally, just a little bit on uh, additional resources and opportunities that would enhance IACUC's ability to contribute. Next slide. I will be using data that was collected from the NAS workshop planning committee survey that was described yesterday by Drs. Harper and Colby. The NIS survey was used to assess key aspects of the development, implementation, and training for the contingency plan. To better understand who completed the survey and how much IACUC input was contributed, of the 195 respondents, seven respondents were IACUC chairs and 33 were IACUC administrative staff. And you can see that information highlighted in yellow. Next slide. When the 195 respondents indicated which groups they believe developed the initial contingency plan, 77% indicated it was animal facility staff. Almost 90% indicated veterinary staff were involved, whereas 36 and 35% respectively felt that the IACUC chair and the IACUC administrative staff played a role. 49% indicated that safety professionals were involved. Next slide. So we're gonna do a polling slide. And the question for you is, which unit at your institution did you feel had the greatest role and responsibility in the development and implementation of the contingency plan and training? And the choices are IACUC and or IACUC office, veterinary and or animal husbandry group, the safety professionals, emergency response and preparedness. So we'll take just a minute to collect responses. Responses are still coming in. I encourage you to go ahead and select your choice. 
Looks like right now there's an overwhelming response at 72% for the veterinary and animal husbandry groups. All right, I don't know how much the numbers will change if we give it a couple of minutes, but um, right now it's 76% veterinary and husbandry groups, 12% IACUC, 8% emergency response preparedness, and about 4% are yeah, 4 safety professionals. So um, in some respects that um, goes along with the survey results. And if we gave it a few more minutes, it, it might change, but um, we'll go on. Next slide, please. Gathering information from the survey results, as well as from a small survey I conducted with IACUC colleagues at other institutions, it appears that IACUC involvement in the plan seems to take many forms and covers a wide range of activity. At one extreme, one of the survey respondents indicated, I am an IACUC representative. The IACUC was minimally involved other than review of the draft document. And largely our animal care group drafted the document and conducts training for its personnel. Next slide. At the other end of the spectrum, a colleague who directs the IACUC at a program which includes a veterinary school, a school of agriculture, and a college of arts and sciences indicated that the IACUC and the IACUC office played a significant role in the development and implementation. Um, during the time there was an attending veterinarian transition and the IACUC office was responsible pretty much for disseminating all information with the many units performing research. So they gathered initial information, sending it to the facilities that worked with USDA species, and they apprised them, them of the requirements and how to comply with the requirements. They also collected the contingency plans from all the facilities and maintained those copies. And they uh, contacted sites to ensure that they fulfill the 30-day requirements for training new personnel. So as you can see, this, um, this IACUC was extensively involved in the process. Next slide. So another poll, the question for you is, uh, the IACUC or IACUC office had a significant role in the development and implementation of the USDA APHIS contingency plan. And the choices are yes, our IACUC played a significant role, no, our IACUC was not significantly involved. And third, our IACUC primarily reviewed the initial plan and then we review and approve it during the semi-annual program review. So we'll take just a minute to collect responses. <clears throat> Okay, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, this poll indicates that a, a large percentage of um, IACUCs review the initial draft and then approve during semi-annual, or review and approve during the semi-annual program review. And then um, that's at 55% and 36% is IACUCs are not significantly involved. And then just a 3% felt that their IACUCs were significantly involved. Whoops, that just jumped up. <laughs> so it might, might change if we gave it more time. We're going to move on here. Next slide. I found it interesting that a review of the USDA APHIS guidance, including um, the contingency planning website, Form 7093, Animal Welfare Act and regulations, and the pertinent animal care tech notes do not specifically identify IACUCs as having a 
specific responsibilities with the development and implementation of the contingency plan. The attending veterinarian and the animal husbandry manager are specifically noted in Form 7093, but there does not appear to be reference to the IACUC. So how do the IACUC and IACUC office know their responsibilities and how they fit in with the overall contingency planning process and implementation? How does the IACUC determine how best to assist with the process? And also, how does the IACUC determine whether there are any APHIS expectations not being fulfilled by the IACUC? This is an area where it could be helpful for APHIS to provide additional guidance. Next slide. So moving on to the topic of what value IACUC participation brings to the contingency planning process, Given the IACUC's somewhat unclear role, even if they're not directly involved in the development and implementation of the contingency plan, there are many things that IACUCs and IACUC offices do well that can assist the institution with, um, with the contingency plan. IACUC offices typically maintain contact lists of all the investigators and researchers at the institution. Also, IACUCs conduct program reviews every six months, often with key leadership present, including IACUC members, the institutional official, attending veterinarian and other veterinarians and animal care representatives, and often safety professionals. And these are all key players um, that would be involved in the plan participation. So some of the things that, that IACUCs can do are to notify researchers about the plan and their areas of responsibility, sending out you know, large mailings to researchers um, using those contact lists, ensuring the review uh, at, during the semi-annual program review. Also, IACUC offices can maintain documents, the minutes and semi-annual program review reports where the plan has been discussed and approved and perhaps training records and individuals requiring training. The IACUC could assist animal care groups with the training and also attend those trainings to be better informed about the process. Next slide. IACUCs are often uh, aware of emergent situations. For example, activists protests, animal activist protests, demonstrations, or visits to campuses or institutions. The IACUC could play a valuable role in informing communication offices and leadership about local protests or national campaigns, especially if those uh, protests may end up in visits at institutions conducting animal research. The IACUC can inform researchers either during semi-annual inspections or by email about local activism and the need to be alert when entering facilities. For example, not allowing tailgating of unauthorized individuals and the need to be aware of unfamiliar people near facilities or laboratories. Maintaining a current contact list of phone numbers and emails is helpful to rapidly contact these key people. And the IACUC has those contact lists already. The information about tailgating, which is um, allowing unauthorized individuals to enter facilities behind uh, an individual using a card access and unfamiliar people around labs or animal facilities is geared more toward decentralized academic institutions that might have many facilities spread out across the institution rather than perhaps an institution with a very centralized animal facility. Next slide. So the IACUC often maintains policies that are pertinent to the animal care program. And it, it could be a benefit for IACUCs to review current policies with a mind to how they may come into play during an emergency. And also if they don't have policies or standards that uh, touch on that area, it, it could be a good idea to develop new standards. I'll use one example of uh, transport policies. 
If an evacuation were to occur, the, the standard could include possible places to relocate animals and transport methods, including the types and quantities of vehicles, equipments, and crates. It could also consider details about how to care for those animals during transport and while at the alternate location. Some of these details, uh, such as equipment and caging needed and the care of the animals, may certainly be more appropriate in an animal husbandry SOP. However, thinking through these details as an IACUC, in collaboration with key leadership from veterinary care, animal husbandry, and safety, and including appropriate details in institutional policies may help that institution be better prepared during an emergency. Next slide. So another uh, policy or standard that comes to mind is um, that of investigator maintained satellite animal housing. Some institutions have you know, one or two of these, some have quite a few. Uh, so it could be uh, important for the IACUC to require that satellite to have its own disaster plan, which can be tied into the institutional disaster plan. And there could be SOPs outlining the investigator responsibilities in an emergent situation. For example, are investigator personnel responsible for the animals during that, that emergency, or is the investigator responsible for contacting the animal care group to oversee the care and transport of animals? Finally, um, the role of student caregivers is important to consider. Are they considered emergency or mandatory personnel? Or are they restricted from the institution during certain conditions, such as severe weather, fire, or demonstrations and protests? Institutions with undergraduate and graduate students who have animal care responsibilities may face a dilemma if that student presence is restricted unless plans for alternate care are developed and communication and contact information is clear. Next slide. So next we'll transition into some of the challenges that were expressed as comments by survey respondents or mentioned by colleagues at other institutions. So one, uh, one point that came up was how do IACUC and I, the IACUC office know exactly where they fit into the plan and processes? Does USDA APHIS expect the IACUC to be responsible for specific areas? And if so, what are they? Is there an expectation that the IACUC have a formal policy or guidance about the contingency plan? And then finally, a respondent indicated, who is required to review the emergency plan at least annually? Is this the IACUC perhaps as part of their program review? As Dr. D. Vicente of USDA mentioned yesterday, it is up to the institution to determine various roles in the contingency planning. It could be helpful to institutions for USDA to note any specific expectations for the IACUC. Next slide. The responses um, from the survey are not necessarily from the IACUC, but they could certainly pertain to the IACUC. And a full 98% of respondents indicated that they already had an existing disaster plan, which involved animals. So under the, the challenge um, of pre-existing disaster plans, some of the comments were the following. We've had a disaster plan for many years. It involves all animals and is routinely updated. Why do we need another plan? Can OLA and USDA develop a memorandum of understanding to potentially reduce burden? Another respondent indicated that redundancy of the plan with pre-existing disaster um, plans creates a parallel administrative program with prescriptive timelines to meet regulations 
without apparent material impact on disaster preparedness. And then a final comment in this area was, does compliance with the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals and ALAC accreditation requirements for a disaster plan meet USDA requirements? As noted on day one of the workshop, the need to have a contingency plan in place is not a burden in that we all want to have the best plan in place to address the welfare needs of the animals. However, since multiple agencies require a disaster plan, it would be helpful to know if it's possible to have one plan that accomplishes all expectations of USDA, OLA, and ALAC. As Dr. D. Vincenti noted, there is information on, on the USDA guidance that an additional plan is not required if the institution already has an existing plan that covers the appropriate areas. Perhaps this information can be included in a more prominent location that's um, readily visible. Next slide. The final uh, area of challenge was in the topic of training and there were quite a few uh, responder comments in that area. What does proper training look like to be compliant with the rule? Another respondent indicated it isn't clear what training is required, who should do the training or who is mandated to receive the training. The 30 day window for providing training to personnel after an update is very tight. Perhaps a 60 day window would be more reasonable. And then finally, a respondent indicated that the type of training needed for student workers providing animal care, for example, only on weekends and holidays, is not clear given their limited scope of responsibility. Regarding the 30-day window, it was noted yesterday that new employees already have to conduct many uh, human resource trainings, uh, facility orientations and onboardings, institutional and safety training. So the 30-day requirement can pose burden not only for the new employee, but also perhaps for the institution and the trainer. Next slide. So how have IACUC's responsibilities or workload changed since implementation of the plan? Depending on the institution, we've seen that the IACUC's role may be limited or quite extensive. Some of the most common roles that the IACUC is playing seem to be reviewing the plan prior to implementation to ensure that the animal wel welfare regulation requirements are met, helping to disseminate plan information and emergent issues to stakeholders, including review and approval semi-annually during the program review, and then perhaps serving as a repository for documents and approvals. Next slide. In terms of additional resources to improve the development and implementation, the survey respondents indicated that the following topics could enhance better understanding of expectations for development and implementation of the plan. 76% of respondents thought that a reference resources area with best practices listed would be very helpful. 74% felt examples of other model contingency plans would be a benefit. And then 65% uh, thought a centralized frequently asked questions section would, would be helpful. There were other things that rated high, such as training videos and online courses, as well as additional guidance documents. Next slide. So what are the, the takeaways from IACUC roles and responsibilities in the contingency plan? It appears that the current IACUC and IACUC office participation is extremely varied from little input to extensive participation. There have been questions asked about why an additional disaster plan is necessary. 
And how can existing plans accepted by OLA and ALAC be meshed with these USDA requirements? There have been requests for additional guidance, such as best practices um, in a resource reference area, examples of model contingency plans, and an FAQ section on the USDA website to help assist institutions. And then finally, and possibly most importantly to IACUX, is the need for clarity regarding expectations for IACUX participation in the plan. Next slide. So thank you for your attention and uh, there'll be a question and answer session after all speakers present. Thank you, Dr. Heenan. Up next, we'll hear from Ms. Katia Harb. She is the Senior Director of the University of Washington's Environmental Health and Safety Department. So she's gonna speak to the, that role. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Katia Harb, and I'm with the University of Washington, and I serve as the EHNS Senior Director. Thank you. My uh, objectives today for this presentation are uh, hopefully to increase your understanding of environment health and safety topic areas for consideration in your contingency planning, to increase understanding of the role and responsibilities of EHNS professionals, and ultimately to be more prepared to incorporate the wide variety of EHNS considerations in your institutional or company contingency plan. Next slide. Thank you. I'd like to start with just an overview of the general preparedness framework, just to help level set the framework that uh, is important to take into consideration when thinking about planning, stakeholders, assessing risks, anticipating incidents that would require a contingency plan. Also, uh, all of the steps, equipment, uh, resources that are needed to respond to an incident that you might anticipate, the process of writing the plan, uh, reviewing the plan, approving the plan, and then continuous process improvement as you test and, and drill and anticipate scenarios uh, over time. And then the other consideration that's important for contingency planning for EHS professionals and, and more broadly is to consider things that might require, uh, that might only last a short term, maybe just a few hours or days, middle, mid-range uh, incidents, maybe things that impact your operations or facilities for, for up to some several weeks, and then even longer, such as, you know, months and years, such as the COVID-19 pandemic or something more uh, catastrophic that might impact your operations. And the APHIS rule very much, their contingency rule components very much uh, aligned with this framework. This is the FEMA framework, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the APHIS rule components about identifying emergency situations, tasks to be carried out in response to emergencies, identifying a clear chain of command, uh, roles and responsibilities, and then response and recovery steps and efforts. So those are all very much well aligned with this overall framework. Next slide. And thinking about emergency situations uh, that may impact EHS and their roles and responsibilities, these are just some examples. Uh, obviously, there are building equipment failures and system disruptions to consider. Uh, I expect that many institutions or companies have experienced this, whether it's electrical, HVAC, or mechanical systems or beyond, uh, animal escapes, uh, natural disasters, or extreme weather conditions, hazardous materials incidents or impacts to containment where a hazardous material may be released, whether that's uh, in the animal, in the animal cage, or materials that are stored within the facility or adjacent facilities that may impact the environment that your research facility uh, is in. There may be things to consider related to construction or special projects around your facility that if something goes wrong could negatively impact operations and may require a contingency plan. Uh, at our institution, that is something that we experienced with a uh, large scale uh, cesium release within one of our research and teaching buildings that was 
um, resulted in disruption for over two years of, of that facility. Uh, and then there could be human intentional and unintentional events, as well as technological failures that impact your building systems, water systems, HVAC systems, and other systems to consider. And from an EHS perspective, all of these types of anticipated events have an EHS component related to uh, people, safety, environmental protection. Uh, next slide. When you are, when institutions are considering who to include in their contingency planning, what are the different roles and expertise? Uh, it is really important to include EHS representatives, uh, whether they're internal to your institution or they're consultants that you bring in. And this is just a broad overview of stakeholders to consider. Uh, for external to your institution, when you're thinking about things like hazardous materials, worker safety, safety of your site, um, things like emergency responders, your local uh, fire, hazmat unit, uh, your police and security units. You might have regional emergency management officials in your location, whether they're in your county or your state. Also regulatory agencies, depending on the nature of the research or facility, you might have to involve them in your contingency planning, specifically if you have select agents or uh, highly regulated radiological research areas, uh, local hospital and emergency departments, utility companies, landlords, tenants, community groups, and even uh, vendors are something to consider in your contingency planning from an external perspective. Um, even when you're thinking about uh, union strikes or, act, or uh, protests on your campus where it might impact vendors either not wanting to cross a picket line or deliver necessary supplies and services to your animal facilities. And then internal to your institution, these are this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the key uh, components in terms of roles and responsibilities and stakeholders to consider. Your leadership representatives, building facilities managers, obviously the veterinary care personnel and uh, animal facility managers, research, researchers, occupants, obviously EHS. And then if you have an occupational health medical provider, whether that's in-house or, or an external occupational health medical provider, it is important to include them in your contingency plans, especially when you're thinking about communicable disease response and prevention, infectious agent disease response and prevention to make sure that your plans adequately address uh, where your workers and your workforce can go for treatment, where the, you know, what is the post uh, exposure surveillance that's needed? Will that medical facility be able to accommodate large numbers of people in a larger scale event? Uh, media and public relations representatives, emergency managers, if they are within your institution, the IACUC, IBCs, your internal police and security unit, research compliance offices, human resources, risk, and legal counsel. And we found that this is important for larger or longer term events. If your research operations are disrupted for lengthy periods of time, you might need help with reaching out to your funding agencies and uh, getting extensions on grants and figuring out how to uh, address people who can't be working and how to uh, make sure that they're compensated or if approving specific leave types for those individuals, and then information security officers and, and consultants. And from an EHS perspective, when we are involved in contingency planning, EHS professionals, they are generally coordinating with all of these roles. And that's why uh, it's important to consider and engage your EHS representatives or an outside consultant if you don't have an in-house EHS professional as part of your planning team. Next slides. Thank you. And for EHS professionals or for EHS considerations in general, the primary focus is the health and safety of people, workers, workers that are in the facility, animal vet and animal care personnel, people that work beyond the animal care facility in your institution. It's also members of the public, visitors and emergency responders who may be uh, having to be brought in in case of an emergency. And it's also the, the environment, the conditions, the atmospheric conditions, the uh, potential air quality 
physical hazards that might be present. And then also second is a second consideration that's primary for EHNS is protecting the environment. So outdoor emissions releases into the air if say your HVAC is compromised and um, filtrate uh, unfiltered air leaves the facility, especially if it's an uh, infectious agent, waterways, uh, land soil protection, regulated waste management. So making sure that there are plans and response procedures in place to address an emission or a loss of containment that leaves a facility. And then also supporting those who are primarily focused on health and safety of animals, preservation of the research uh, agents and, and experiments and security, minimizing property damage and more. Thank you, next slide. And for the EHNS, topic areas for consideration and contingency planning and emergency preparedness. Uh, they're, they're generally, they are broad, but summarizing them into these categories, it's hazardous material safety management. So having uh, somebody or a group of people who have knowledge and expertise in cradle to grave hazardous material safety, radiological safety, health physicists, uh, chemical safety, industrial hygienists, chemists, biological safety, and then general occupational safety and health, physical safety, medical management, and emergency response. And, and again, depending on your facility and institution, you may need more or less of different types of expertise based on your agents. For example, if you, if you don't have radiological materials, you may not need to have that level of expertise. If you have select agents, you, you definitely want to have somebody with that expertise uh, on your contingency planning uh, team and helping with that. And when we think about assessing hazardous material exposure to people, these the EHNS roles and responsibilities include understanding what the hazardous levels are, what are levels that are immediately dangerous to life and health, what are the exposure pathways to people? Is it inhalation? Is it uh, ingestion? You know, what is the exposure risk if there was a catastrophic event and uh, containment was lost or chemicals were spilled or liquid nitrogen was released and atmospheric conditions and procedures associated with that. They're also considering the animals that and materials that have been in contact with hazardous materials, such as you know waste bedding, cages, uh, equipment, and then also medical management and response. So again, as, as I mentioned in the previous slide, having um, protocols in place and coordinating with emergency personnel in, in units and providers for responding to a situation where there could be a communicable disease versus illness, incident, or uh, exposure events. And then compliance. When there are incidents where there could be a loss of containment or people injured or exposed, there are a number of compliance requirements. And then also physical hazards, such as heavy machinery, uh, energized equipment, falls. If there's an earthquake, you know, assessing the area for physical hazards after the fact and making sure that pathways and, uh, and egress is clear for personnel as well as uh, helping with supporting the responders. Next slide. And more about the types of activities that EHNS professionals can help with in the contingency plan. Assessing risk is, is, a, is an important one. Helping with the different scenarios that you might be uh, preparing for that involve these EHNS topic areas. You know, what is the likelihood of something to happen? What is the potential impact? And having a general risk assessment of those different impacts for different scenarios as it relates to people and environmental protection, people safety and environmental protection. And, and that is something that EHNS professionals can help with and help risk rank, you know, the different types of hazards and, and as they apply to your specific facility, your containment structures, the animals that are housed and, and other considerations. They can help develop standard operating procedures including specifications for environmental monitor, monitoring, uh, chemical exposure limits, 
helping to select the appropriate PPE for the hazards that might be encountered by personnel. They can help, again, coordinate with the emergency medical responders and emergency care personnel. They coordinate with emergency responders on site if um, there is a fire or a hazmat unit that's deployed in response to an incident that you experience. Uh, and the EHS professionals can help communicate what are the different uh, materials in this space, what are the potential hazards they can help be that liaison as it relates to hazardous materials communication and risk communication. They often serve on incident command. Uh, is part of the incident command structure. So if there is a larger scale emergency or incident that requires forming an emergency operations center where incident command is initiated, EHS uh, professionals often serve on that incident command, especially if there's something that could impact people or the environment. And they can also serve as a safety officer role in an incident or emergency. They also, as I mentioned earlier, serve as a compliance liaison with federal, state, local agencies, and even in some cases, funding agencies. Uh, some of those agencies are federal and state OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Environmental Protection Agencies, Radiation Protection Regulatory Agencies, whether they're state or federal, uh, NIH, and then uh, local health authorities or other local health uh, regulators. And then also with EHNS, roles and responsibilities, your EHNS professionals can help with either conducting, leading drills and training for those types of incidents that you're preparing for that involve hazardous materials or personal injury and illness, or they can support training in, in drills, depending on the scenario. Next slide. And in terms of contingency planning and information that is important for EHNS assessment and EHNS professionals to have to support either the preparation or the response, are uh, it's very important for e for floor plans, including information on building systems, to be available and up to date. And that uh, sometimes includes close partnership with facilities units, but things like uh, knowing where. Where, what type of HVAC system is in place? Where is the location of the supply and exhaust fans? Where are the outdoor air intakes? What is the directional airflow within the facility? Where, where are rooms supposed to be positive and negatively pressurized? And this is important because if there is a disruption in HVAC and there is say an infectious agent in a space, it will help understand if there's a potential for those agents to have migrated out of the facility and also just help understand where uh, containment barriers need to be uh, placed in an incident like uh, that might be large scale and impact the facility. Plumbing, electrical, structural information is also very important to have. It's important to keep and maintain a current chemical inventory by room, which includes the chemical names, physical properties, the hazards, uh, quantities, volumes, and that includes hazardous drugs, toxins, compressed gases. That information is really important to keep up to date for an EHNS professional and also with liaisoning with emergency responders. Oh, can we go back one more? Oh, thank you. Um, can, can we go back? I think we went ahead a little bit too fast. Thank you. Also, I'll, uh, with radiological materials, biological materials, if there are any uh, highly uh, secured areas that need to be taken into account. It's important to have information about the equipment that's used, a type of animal uh, caging and housing. Uh, for example, if there's a, a ventilated cage rack, are there HEPA filters on the lids? If, if the HVAC fails, you know, what is the potential for an infectious agent or a hazardous material to escape a cage? Will it fail into a neutral airflow pattern? Those are all considerations for EHNS professionals in assessing risk and response. And then really uh, critical is up-to-date contact lists for your contingency plan for your EHNS professionals, but also in order for EHNS professionals to reach out to all the other people that might have information to inform the risk assessment in an incident. So facility staff, as I mentioned, uh, the researchers, the animal care staff, uh, and, and more. Those we found in our experience um, 
that often contact lists sometimes, you know, unless they're intentionally reviewed um, yearly, many times, you know, they do go out of date or people rotate and the information doesn't rotate. So that's a very critical component to keep up to date. And next slide. Thank you. Another consideration for institutions, and and I understand there's a lot of uh, there there are a lot of factors to consider when it comes to responding after a larger scale incident when there might be um, something more catastrophic, such as you know an earthquake or a tornado or a flood, where you're not sure of the in, inside condition uh, of the space and if it's safe to enter and. Oftentimes, a, a local hazmat unit will respond and assess the environment, set up a containment barrier, but it, there might be situations where your local responders may not be able to go in or, um, or may not be able to get to your facility if it is a larger scale event. And one consideration is whether or not to have your own internal trained uh, group that responds to things like spills, or emergencies to help make sure that the animals are cared for, fed, to support safety of the veterinary staff in and out of the building. And this is these are images shown from, from our institution. We, we have a response team like this that includes uh, EHS personnel as well as well as veterinarians and veterinary care staff, and they train and they drill a few times a year. They maintain a response trailer with personal protective equipment, SCBAs, communications devices, and extra supplies and equipment needed to respond to an incident that's maintained outside of the facility, but it could be brought into the animal facility or near the animal facility in case of an incident. And the, uh, the image on the top is actually from our local news um, network. When we did have the cesium release that I mentioned earlier, we did deploy our we call it a pre-entry assessment team to help uh, evaluate the animal space, verify it was safe to go in, and our personnel were able to keep the animals fed and alive and, and safe um, as part of our response to that incident. And, and these units, these internal response groups, if they are um, implemented within your institution, it's they do require resources, they require people, time, money to maintain the supplies, replenish the PPE training, uh, and in some places may not be able to do that. But if if you do, do the, decide to implement something like this, it can be very useful and especially in a more catastrophic incident. Next slide. Transport uh, and disposal of, of hazardous materials, EHNS can also have a role in helping to develop protocols for the safe transport and disposal for chemicals. If there is a situation that's larger in scale, there may be um, abandoned chemicals or experiments left open. There might be infectious agents that need to be um, removed safely and, and disposed of according to proper methods. And EHS professionals can help with this, with identifying the protocols, the safe transport methods. Um, that includes, you know, re relocating animals and in their equipment, and whether it's within a building or outside of a building. And then EHS professionals can also help with facilitating uh, vendors to help collect the waste and and do decontamination of those spaces as needed. Next slide. Another role that's important to consider in contingency planning and emergency response is hazard and risk communication, especially if there's an event that may generate media or public interest and concern from your institution and company or beyond the, the broader community. And especially if it involves hazardous material, like a biological agent, a radiological agent, something, um, a human health hazard and working closely with media and public relations communications experts is definitely something that EHNF professionals have a role in in characterizing the, the hazards and the risks, preparing talking points about the risk to people, risk to the environment, how what is being done to, to ensure the safety of people in the environment, and then giving those regular updates and 
it, it, at least, you know, in, in my experience, the media and public relations people do rely heavily on the EHNS uh, subject matter experts to help prepare that information and characterize risk and communicate risk. So that's something to also keep in mind as you develop your contingency plans. Next slide. Another, again, consideration is assessing the potential for physical hazards from a large equipment, thinking about a maybe if there is a large project that's happening and you're developing an emergency or contingency plan around that, or there might be, as I mentioned earlier, an earthquake where there could be physical hazards, thinking about having safety measures in place and response measures in place for higher risk projects that may impact your animal and research facility. These are images from our institution during the removal of an irradiator that had um, cesium. And there were a number of considerations with lifting and, and, and cranes and, and fall hazards and moving heavy equipment, awkward equipment through public hallways. And that's also something uh, to, to plan for and verify that you have the right safety measures in place ahead of time and the response measure is in place if something goes wrong. Next slide. And training and drills are so important as, you know, as is outlined in the, the rule and as many of you are probably well aware of, utilizing a combination of tabletop exercises and then functional and on the ground drills and exercises is so important. And to do those on a regular basis, at least annually. And doing different types of exercises with different groups. It's, we found that it's very important and helpful to include emergency responders for some of our uh, higher risk and higher regulated areas in our drill planning and preparedness. And so that this, uh, for example, if you have a select agent facility um, and there's a medical emergency inside, you know, where, what will the first aid procedures be within your containment facility? Where will you meet the emergency responders when they come on site? Uh, where are they not allowed to go? Where do they need to be escorted? Things like that are really helpful to plan and prepare for ahead of an incident. And then these are some images from, from our facility where we've done you know spill drills and exercises, medical emergency drills, and in full PPE as well. And it's also very important as part of drills and training to do a hot wash or a debrief as soon as possible after to review where they're any gaps? Were there any incidents or situations we did not anticipate? Is our SOP sufficient to address this type of incident? Can, can we improve upon that? And having that be a collaborative, open discussion where um, recommendations are made and then implementing those recommendations to continue to strengthen your emergency preparedness and contingency plans is really important. Next slide. All right, these are some EHS considerations and points of emphasis that we realize were really important um, in response to a large scale event and specifically the cesium event that I mentioned earlier. Pre-planning drills, effective working relationships with all of the people involved in responding to an incident uh, are, were very valuable to have in place ahead of the incident and made things go so much smoother. Uh, when we did have to respond to an incident that took several months and in, in, in a couple of years. Having a really clear roles and responsibilities defined with primary and backup representatives when you can for redundancy in case personnel need to take breaks or they can't make it to, to the site. When you're thinking about your needs and supplies, Think broadly uh, when you're thinking about short, medium, and long-term incident that may occur. Even things like basic office supplies, communication devices, extension cords. We found that we were running to Home Depot um, buying extension cords and duct tape because we ran out. Um, extra PPE, lots of extra PPE, gloves, gowns, face protection, shoe covers. Um, and then if if you do have the supply of emergency supplies, do inspect it and replenish it as needed. There are things that could expire or degrade over time. Coordinate with your vendors ahead of time and think about what service contracts would be helpful to have in place. 
for example, we had a situation where our negative 80 degree freezers were starting to fail and we had to have a uh, we had to find new freezer storage very quickly and calling vendors and working to see who can bring freezers, where can we relocate our samples and um, waste collection. We needed additional waste collection vendors uh, to help collect accumulated biohazardous and chemical waste. And then also equipment service. Some of our vendors were not willing to go into a facility that um, had a, a chemical release. We were not able to service our elevator for months because we could not find an elevator technician. These are things to think about and prepare for ahead of time. And then planning these events that could take place weeks or months or longer. Uh, where where could you establish a workspace close to the uh, animal facility? What supplies and equipment do you need? Planning for uh, escorts and facility access for responders. This was also something that, especially in the midst of an emergency, we needed. We had a lot of people in and out of the building, and it was a secured building, and we needed to ar arrange to have extra people for escorts and um, in, in key card access quickly. That was something. That's something to plan for, and then consider the mental health of the personnel uh, that are responding. These situations, especially larger events, catastrophic events, catastrophic events could be very, very, are very, very tiring and, and fatiguing mentally, physically for the personnel responding. Plan for providing meals and water, breaks and shifts if you can, and then consider local lodging and places to sleep for the people on site, and especially for those who have really long commutes so they don't have to travel back and forth every day. Next slide. And summarizing key points uh, for EHS roles and responsibilities and considerations, involve EHS professionals, including your employee health, medical providers, in the development and testing of your contingency plan. I can't emphasize that enough. It will be, it will definitely strengthen your plan, uh, along with clearly defined roles and responsibilities in your contingency plan. A current contact and phone list and phone tree is essential. Review and discuss the plan with all of the people who have a role in responding, at least annually. And when conducting exercises and drills to test and improve your plan and your SOPs, again, involve all of those with responsibilities for responding, including your maintenance and facility staff, external emergency responders, and uh, medical providers as well. It helps keep them current on the plan. It helps them engage. It helps you be more prepared when or if a situation does occur in the future. Thank you. I think that is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya. Up next, we'll hear from Brian Ebert. Um, he is the Senior Manager of the Global Facilities at AbbVie. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Anybody? Perfect. All right. Well, again, kind of like Katya said, thank you for the opportunity to come here and uh, talk about this. Contingency planning is obviously critical for all of our operations. And I, um, again, I've been with AbV for coming up on 27 years next week. So I've seen the evolution of our contingency plan. And I'm going to speak to our experiences as well as uh, some of the perspectives I've uh, seen in my time. Next slide, please. Um, so again, how does our program representing fitting into the overall contingency plan? Again, for AbV, I'm at the corporate headquarters in Lake County, Illinois. We've got 18,000 employees at this campus. So it's not just an animal facility. It's a large scale. It's actually a small city, I guess you could put it in perspective. So to put our contingency plan together, you know, we involved the veterinarians, um, multiple facility managers, our senior animal care techs or group leaders as we refer to them, and then also wanted to get our veterinary technicians involved so that they're helping put together like the formulary that's in the contingency plan. So in the event we use it, they actually understand what's in there. Um, again, kind of like Katya said, you know, we're working in accordance with our own maintenance staff. We keep maintenance on site 24 hours a day across all uh, trades, working with our security team, um, again, our situation here, it's something to look at is, are you leasing space? For us, we lease still from Abbott in some perspective. So you have that coordination of AbV logistics and Abbott logistics on the same property. Um, again, partnering with EH&S. And then we also 
either an on-site fire department if you have it or your local fire department is keeping them uh, in the perspective. Um, again, for the site this large, we do have a overall disaster plan and then comparative medicine plan kind of rolls up into that. And that was evident during the COVID journey in 2020 of this is what the site is doing. What are we doing kind of locally in the animal program, but actually being in one cohesive team? Um, again, we've got leads from all areas that are aware of our plan and making sure that everybody's got a good perspective. And then we actually utilize this through the uh, In Case of Crisis app. If anybody's looking for an app, that's what we utilize. We can take that conversation offline, um, but it's been very user-friendly and easy to navigate. Um, but again, you wanna get those key stakeholders. And I think that's the biggest thing with contingency planning. Again, doing that annual review, but it's people change job roles, people retire, somebody else gets hired in and keeping those phone lists current or personally, the person moved and they don't live in that house anymore if they still have a landline is what are their phone numbers. Um, again, training is huge, whether it be hands-on or computer-based. Um, what we've done is scaled our training to support more of the uh, management side of the contingency plan and then actually one for the technical staff and how their role plays into the success of execution in the contingency plan. Next slide, please. Um, again, like I said, all comparative medicine staff are trained annually. What we typically do for new staff is we'll wait till about 60 days after they're onboarded and then actually go into doing a contingency plan training. Um, I think we can all agree that when you initially hire somebody, the training list is yay long and you're just reading, clicking, signing and moving on. Um, but we really wanted them to understand why we have this. What does it mean? What's the importance of it? And we feel that giving it to them initially on week one, it's just too much. There's too much to take in. Um, let them kind of soak up the business, learn some processes, and then kind of start tying it all together. Um, again, reviewing that plan, making sure it's updated. Any plan's great, but if you don't look at it for three years, it's going to go stagnant and be out of date. Um, again, reviewing supplies, equipment, um, and making sure what do you have available. I know our contingency supplies are actually from a vet perspective, are three miles offsite at a warehouse that AbV has, so that if the buildings are impacted, we've still got access to our supplies and they're not sitting in the same building where the animals are, which may negate your contingency plan. Um, again, looking at the picture on the right, this is just a, I got a couple different pictures throughout the presentation, but we use the generalized formatting relative to category. Um, you know, if you need maintenance and utilities information relative to what type of an event, chilled water, electrical, you're looking in the purple section of the page and you kind of gravitate to that. You know, for moving animals on site, you're going to in the green area and getting direction like that. Next slide, please. Um, again, like I said, comparative medicine is represented at all levels in the site-wide disaster plan. And I think that's the bigger thing if you don't already have that presence in your organization is getting that relationship built with the overall entity of, hey, we're over here, we've got a contingency plan, but we all need to work together and not be conflicting resources potentially. Um, again, I think the biggest thing that I've seen over the last 20 years is having the ability for electrical support. Um, here at our campus, we actually have our own coal plant as a backup um, beyond having land-based generators to run the full buildings or actually generators sitting on trailers that we will pull up to the building in about 60 to 90 minutes, we can restore full electrical capacity. But if you reflect on your organization, how many more negative 80 freezers do you have? Do you have walk-in coolers, ventilated cage systems? Everything seems to tie into power. You know, new rodent systems that got cameras built in them how much of these systems can be maintained if you lose power? And to me, I put that as, uh, as the most critical item. Um, but again, having that perspective of what your whole site is doing relative to your program size is a big deal. Um, again, on the right, this is what the dashboard or playbook as they refer to it in that in case of crisis app. So we've got our plan with a nice little dog in there. Then it rolls up into our Lake County one. We've even got a section in the, uh, playbook for our global animal welfare 
perspective and giving guidance in the event of a disaster. Next slide, please. Um, again, major obstacles, I just feel like it's all relative to the relationships in your organization. Um, here where I'm at, it, it really comes from the top down and getting that CEO support, um, institutional official, whatever it might be, to be like, hey, this is something we must do so that we can basically avoid being on the five o'clock news, i.e. purchasing a land-based generator to support the institution and maintain that ideal um, vivarium operation on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, it can come down to budget, staffing resources, but having those conversations to figure out what do we have, where do we need to get to, is it going to be something we do over two years? Um, again, involving those key research stakeholders so that they're informed and familiar. You know, for us, we have that land-based generator. It's literally a two-second delay and we get full power restored, but we go through a test twice a year to actually fail the system, bring the generator online. And we do that fail during the workday so that everybody can kind of experience it and potentially identify pinch points that if we were to have an outage, these are things we need to focus on as we try to get through the facility and see what is working, what maybe needs a reset to maintain standard business. I think another key component is annual tours and refreshers. Construction happens, walls go down, walls go up new doors put in, um, is getting your emergency response team, your maintenance team that's going to be part of this process familiar with the inside of the building. And it's not a one and done. And then five years later, an event happens. It's an annual journey to come through the buildings, see what's changed, what new research, you know, list agent, whatever you're working on, um, make them familiar with where those challenges lie in your organization. Um, again, just another picture on the right. This is kind of the dashboard when you get into our comparative medicine app of the different facets of the uh, the program, and then you can just select on the on the little button and gain the the detailed information without having to flip fifty pages in a binder. Oops, next slide. I hit the space bar. That didn't work so good. Um, again, tools to be beneficial. Reflecting for me, soon after I joined the organization, um, we were actually enhancing our contingency plan to prepare for the dreaded day of Y2K. Um, so we went from what I would call an average contingency plan to something extremely robust. You know, at the time we were buying portable generators, lamps and air conditioning units. Now we've replaced all that with redundancy in our air handlers. We've actually invested in uh, room level key switches, which allow us to turn the air of supply off into rooms in the event of an emergency to not uh, overtax the system. And again, investor, investing in uh, site generators with that automatic transfer switch so that you can restore operation as quick as possible. Next slide, please. Um, again, items to consider, it's all about the money. What's your budget look like in the near term or over the course of two, maybe three years to purchase, install, you know, maybe it's a year to get a generator that you need for your institution, but we're going to buy it now, but we're not going to put it in until July of 2025. Um, having that long range planning of, okay, we've got 20 negative 80 freezers, but what is their end of life and looking at a plan to basically replace them when they're two or three years prior to end of life so that they're not just dying. Um, because obviously those in, uh, units hold critical samples and data for your institution. But when you lose a freezer, you can lose a lot of information, which then creates more research. Um, sometimes you got to get creative. You know, I, for those that may have heard my talk at ALAS, um, we were able to navigate the COVID journey as the most recent example by sourcing PPE through a restaurant supply store. So you got to get creative in where are you buying your PPE from? Because obviously PPE is critical. We need it on a daily basis relative to job function and what you're doing, but you can't go to the same vendor necessarily as have that creative network built to get through your obstacles. Um, again, relationships with adjacent facilities relative to geography. Um, and again, I think Katya touched on it is how are you going to move the animals? Do you have a truck? Do you have your own truck? Um, who can drive? 
what's the logistics to get from point A to point B? Are the roads interrupted? Um, and having, you know, test runs to drive from point A to point B if you do need to relocate animals. Um, it, it's obviously a critical one is what are your supplies relative to the animals you got on site? And then doing regularly scheduled reviews of it, assurance of expiration dates, tracking it on a spreadsheet, smart form, whatever you may have, um, because it's not real good if it's all of a sudden a year expired when you go to utilize it. Next slide, please. Um, again, for us, our contingency plan has been extremely robust and in place for now 25 years, thanks to Y2K and uh, legacy Abbott's foresight of wanting to be extremely responsive because there was extreme panic of what was going to happen on that January 1st of 2000. We were fine, as many others were, but it gave us a huge leg up in uh, getting that response ready. Um, again, doing that training with staff, and I've got some upcoming slides of different uh, documents that we go over with the staff and training to give them a perspective of what's in the contingency plan. But again, I think it's the appropriate timelines of training the staff and understanding what it is. And then it's giving them a refresher of, hey, this is something new based on the type of animals we got, the type of research being done, and that it's not just being done at the management level because it's gonna take more than just managers to actually execute the plan in the event of a uh, real life um, experience happening. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a couple, I got, I don't know, three or four different slides of different uh, pictures that I pulled out of our plan. So this is, you know, the first one that I put in is just establishing that site command. And I'm not going to read through it. You guys can all glance at it, but it just kind of gives a flow chart of if this, then that, if this, then that. And sharing that with um, your new employees to give them the perspective of, hey, we got a contingency plan. You've heard about it, but this is some of the things that uh, we've got established in that so they can understand why we have a contingency plan. And I think the understanding of why gives them a lot more value in doing the training from my perspective. Um, again, it's using that same color code chart at the bottom, as you can see how it ties it together. Of The pink is a lot of comparative medicine actions that we need to figure out and who is gonna be that most senior manager. Um, again, comparing this to the COVID journey, you know, we had a point of contact that always sent every communication on what is the plan, whether it be daily or weekly, so that the staff didn't have to question, well, last week it was this person and now this week it's this person and what's the most current is having a constant point of contact, whether it's a two day event or two month event or two year event um, is, is keeping folks apprised of information, but having the source remain constant the whole time. Next slide, please. Um, again, like I said, to me, electrical outage is the biggest. Um, this is just our flow chart of, okay, we had an event, what are we doing? These are all the different things that we need to run through and check for functionality, assurance, and integrity for the business um, across the different buildings on campus. Um, and again, we're fortunate because we do have 24-hour utility support. So it's also having that quick conduit, whether it be cell phones may not work. So do you have walkie-talkies or some other uh, mode of communication available for uh, quick communication across site. Next slide, please. Um, this is what we call our facility assessment form. So it's something that we've got pre-printed in each building, as well as in the offsite supplies to be able to hand out to the animal care technicians, veterinary technicians, and go out to the different rooms in the building, figure out what's going on in each room, answer those questions up above, and then bring that back to command central and be like, okay, you know, this hallway on this floor is basically tier one and we need to focus our efforts there. And it's basically a, a quick way to gather everything and get it all um, in one room and then try to triage based on situations. Next slide, please. Um, I, I can say, I don't know, it was what, 12 years ago, probably the, the most, uh, the first real test of the system was we actually had a 20 inch snowfall happen between 10 o'clock at night and five in the morning. I mean, it was like being in a snow globe all the time. Well, 
our decision was we would buy cots and actually we slept on site. I was the, the lead person, slept in a conference room for two days. Um, and these were some of the essentials that we actually purchased and had on site for the staff to be able to assure that for the two days we forecasted of not getting out of the building, we could sleep, enjoy ourselves, and also eat three meals a day. Um, I, I think if you're in one of those events, you know, from my perspective, as I coached all the team, I said, hey, we're going to be heroes today but don't work fast because we're not going anywhere and we could quickly become a zero and a big headache if we got to try to get you to a hospital. So just take your time and basically like put it in low gear and work slow and steady. Um, but also assurance of food and, you know, carbohydrates to keep the, uh, keep the team going. Next slide. That is all from my perspective. I'd like to thank everybody for joining today. Um, again, uh, the bottom here is my personal hashtag I've made at AbV. It's called Make Possibilities Real. And I would task each of you to make possibilities real at your organization. Think proactively, speak up, and make your voice heard that we need this, we must do this, and this is my proposal to get to the end game. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Brian. Um, up next, we're going to hear from Dr. Gustavo Soberano on the VET response team view. Thank you very much. Um, and well, thank you very much and for inviting us to participate on this event. Um, I hope my audio is coming okay. Um, I'm, I'm on the road, so I'm basically not at my official duty station. Uh, so please let me know if the audio comes right. So, um, so a little bit of my background. I'm one of the assistant directors for animal welfare operations. Um, I oversee uh, primarily the western portion of the United States and Southwest region. Um, and I'm a station in California and uh, where we do see, um, and we have a, a large amount of emergencies happening in this area. In addition, I'm also overseeing the emergency management uh, unit within uh, animal care. Um, next slide. So as, uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Division mentioned yesterday, uh, the, you know, during his presentation yesterday, the contingency rule, great, thank you. The contingency rule was posted on December 3rd of 2021, but it did not come into effect until 180 days later in July 5th. So we are almost at the two year, um, we are almost at the two years from the, the mark of the implementation of the rule. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing, you know, like the, the contingency plan uh, applies to multiple, you know, basically to all our regulated facilities. But in your case, you know, from the point of view of the research facilities, this is what, what the definition of a research facility is. So basically you are working with regulated animals in research and it includes basically also the transportation of live animals into commerce. And if you receive funds grants, you know, basically. So this is, this is basically what the definition and we can go to the next slide where we finish with the definition of what uh, research uh, facilities are. And so, and sorry, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not gonna read this slide, but again, I just wanted to make the, the distinction be between what uh, research versus other regulated facilities. Also, there is a contingency plan, a contingency rule um, affecting them. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, so what is contingency planning? <clears throat> so it's definitely, it's a plan to mitigate unexpected events of circumstances. And in this case, um, we, we talk about unexpected events from most of the time, we just focus on the very, very large events, but you know, like natural disasters, so that type of things. But the reality is that there are multiple things that can happen on your daily operations. And some of the previous speakers, they already talk about that. You know, for example, the HVAC is potentially one of the most 
common emergency that many institutions, many facilities have. And like we're just talking about today, you know, we are I'm here in California and we're gonna have a heat wave, you know, we're having one of the heat domes and that puts a lot of pressure into the electric grid and we have seen facilities that basically they lose power during this time because so many people are utilizing energy just to try to cool their their facilities so definitely um you know have you planned for that so that is basically uh you know what contingency planning can uh, can can check um so but again sometimes contingency doesn't have to be for a bad event. A lot of the time, you know, you can plan uh, a large conference, a large event that, you know, and contingency planning for anything that can happen during that event. That is it's one of the things, you know, that is how we look into, into what contingency plan is. Next, next uh, slide, please. So, so you you know again we you have probably and and again just from listening to the question that has been submitted for during the conference, uh, most of you if not all of you already have an emergency plan, and then so you have talked about you know in, in this term you know what is a contingency, so it is not necessarily complicated but there is planning and training involved when it comes to the contingency rule, and then so. Probably one of the one of the examples is like a fire drill, right? So where you have to have a plan, you are exercising your plan through a fire drill, and you are basically uh, looking into who is going to be doing what, what are you supposed to do, what are your staff supposed to do. So basically, when we think about the contingency plan, contingency rule, that is exactly what you know. Uh, a, a, a fire drill will be a good example of what a contingency plan should be um, considered. Next slide, please. So, when when we come and think about uh, the contingency rule, I mean, basically, Katrina was the major event that a lot of us refer, and you know, this was our basically we're going to almost. Uh, you know, like uh, the 20 anniversary of, uh, of the Katerina event. And that probably was one of the situations that basically that was the, the situation that triggers for animal care and Congress to come with the contingency plan and the contingency rule. So one of the things is during the Katerina events, the storm was, you know, the actual hurricane was not the significant event. It was basically, the, when the storm landfall, you know, it wasn't that significant. It was actually after events of the landfall, basically when the levees broke and how it affected not just uh, the, the population living in New Orleans, but also affected uh, the, the, the research community. So there were multiple events, multiple facilities that were affected by these. And as you can see in some of the pictures, uh, animals have to be evacuated. And so basically the question always came, are you prepared for this type of events? Uh, next, next slide, please. So when we talk about the, the, contingency, the contingency rule, so this is just basically the, the language is straight from the regulation. But, but the question that we always need to ask is how does it translate to what the entities have to do? We need to understand that, that currently the contingency rule, and one of the things is the contingency rule, we basically take it as a roadmap to protect the health of your animals and the research that you are doing in a case of an emergency. Key element or a key phrase on this in this definition is which could be reasonably anticipated. So it's one of the situations, you know, we have multiple regions, multiple events, multiple situations in, in um that can affect uh, your facility, depending on where you are, depending on the area. So for example, if you live in California you're going to be have, having to be account, you know basically considering situations like fires 
you know, um, we need to check, for example, situations about earthquakes, tsunamis, flooding, this type of events. Less likely to have a tsunami if you are in Oklahoma, right? But you need to consider for situations like uh, tornadoes. And just two weeks ago, we just had a significant amount of tornadoes going through that through those areas. So there is basically there is there are difference between the regions, but you need to account for those situations. And again, it's not only the situations for big disasters, but these small events. And somebody was talking, for example, situations like during protests, you know, how can you, can you actually access your facilities? Can people come and access, you know, your staff can actually come in, into your facilities and look into that. You know, we have situations, for example, uh, you know, like the HVAC system failing. And we have, in, we have situations where facilities have you know, basically animals who are regulated, who have to be under a specific amount of temperature control and their age back goes off. So again, those are the type of thing where you have the redundancy to actually uh, consider, um, you know, and just basically provide the, provide the, the care that the animals need. So, so one, of the, one of the situations that we try to look in, um, and, and if we can go to the next slide, please is what the contingency rule, you know, determines. And, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, the contingency rule basically, you know, there are four points that need to be addressed during the contingency rule. And as long, and this is one of the things that probably there's, there is a, a situation here, and, and pro, Dr. Davicenti also mentioned this, as long as you have addressed these four points in your emergency planning and your emergency, um, contingency planning, we are not going to cite you for not having a contingency plan. So if you have an emergency plan that another institution is requiring you to have. And as long as these four elements are included as part of the contingency of your con contingency planning, we are not going to cite you for that. And that is one of the things where the contingency rule, it just requires you to have these elements. So. An important element for us is to use the contingency rule primarily as a, as a planning tool, basically as a roadmap for you to look at the different emergencies that you potentially can have and how to plan and coordinate with all the different elements in your community, within your institution, in order to be able to care for the animals and that, that, that you are in charge of. And then, so one of the, one of the presenters, you know, mentioned, um, talk about the national response frame, framework from, from FEMA. And, and basically these four elements are astray from the, from the national re, uh, response framework. So again, as long as you have it, as you have them, there is no, you know, like we, we won't come and cite you for that. Now, when we look and actually over the last two years, we have only cited at the research level over the last two years, we have only cited facilities 34 times. That's, that's the number of us, the time that we have cited facilities for not having a complete or not having a, 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 a contingency plan. But when, we usually, if, if there is a significant event affecting the welfare of the animals, most likely, if you have a contingency plan, we are not going to cite you for a lack of contingency plan, but we are basically going to go and look what exactly happened. And if the animals were affected by wh whichever event, then most likely the citation is going to be more related to the actual action of what happened with, with, with those animals. But again, um, we do we do get a lot of questions about you know the contingency rule and how we are going to be doing citations and things like that. But again, it's it's we we are trying to really focus this not too much on 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 looking into what citation is going to come because of you not having a contingency plan, rather focusing and using the contingency plan as a tool for you. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So here is where, 
here is one of the things that you know I was mentioning. You know, like basically only 34 citations we have had, and then it is important. You know, like it is important to consider that when we are thinking about the contingency the contingency plan, that as long as you have those four points, you should be uh, you should be in compliance. Now we do have a specific forms to help you to navigate through those four plans that you have. And, you know, the optional form 7093, you know, is, is one of the forms that you can actually use in order to, to develop your contingency plan if you don't have one. But um, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, please. So, so here is where the the main the main point about you know what I I want to make the the emphasis in this conversation. So these are the four plans, the four questions that the contingency rule asks. So always the, the the question is, do you know the answer to these basic questions? And so so not too many papers. So so basically, the the reality is that as long as you have these four points addressing your contingency plan, you should be in compliance with the contingency rule. Now, one of the things here is that my background, you know, the part of the background that I have is in emergency management. So we can bring good emergency practice and good emergency management ideas into the conversation, especially when we are talking to the different facilities, how to implement their contingency rule, how to implement their contingency planning. But at the same time, there is nothing in the regulation that requires you, for example, to train in incident command system. The regulation doesn't ask you to do that. Is this a good idea? Yes, it is a good idea but it is a good idea for you to implement how you're gonna implement your training to do tabletop exercises, uh, functional exercises. Yes, it is a good idea to do those type of things. You know, does the regulation doesn't require you to be in communication with your local emergency management, um, you know, at the, at the county level, but it is a good idea to have this type of uh, communication and coordination. So let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so, so the first portion of of this uh, of this of the rule, and this is something that the previous um, e speakers had already addressed. This, you know, basically, when is when you're when when you're basically um, the contingency rule is going to take into effect. So you identify the when. When are the type of events that might affect your, your facility? So when do you trigger your, your action? What emergencies are most likely for your facility? The rule effect affects, the rule affects all of those who are registered and transport animals into commerce. And it also affects businesses all across the US. So as I was mentioning earlier, just think about not just the big natural events, but also think about electrical outages, faulty HVAC systems, you know, fires, floats. One of the situations that uh, that we encountered last year, um, especially here in California, was the amount of snow that that basically fell into some of the areas where people didn't have access, for example, to be able to go out of specific regions. So that brought significant issues, especially when it came to, you know, how much food they have for their animals. You know, if they needed, if somebody was sick, if they needed to bring, for example, a veterinarian to look at their animals. So those are the type of events that we, we want you to, to think about, you know, when you, are, when you are preparing, when you are working on your contingency, your contingency planning. So think about animal escapes, you know, what about if you are transported the animals, if there's a vehicle breakdown, you know, um, and also, you know, vehicle accidents is the other one. It's something that you need to, you need to consider. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So when considering your particular situation, it is important to consider the number and the type of animals that, that you have. So what type of research are you doing? 
you need to consider situations like, do you evacuate or do you shelter in place? If you evacuate, where are you gonna go? So one of the questions that always we ask, especially with, the, with, with our regulated facility is, do you know your partners in your region? Do you know, for example, if you, if you are doing um, a type of research that requires specific uh, facilities, do you know anybody else in your community who is doing the same type of research or in your network? that you might be able to move your animals to there. You know, do you, you know, like, do you know who can potentially shelter your animals if you need to evacuate them? Um, do they have the capacity? Do they have actually the space for you to do that? You know, do you have to transport them? Do you have veterinary care available for those type of things? And then, so the other things, you know, again, part of what, we don't specify in the in the contingency rule if you practice or do you do exercises with your fire department, but it is a good idea to do it. So it, again, it's one of those situations where when we focus on the emergency portion of an event, you know, having those connections with your emergency coordinate operation systems. Uh, system in your county is important. Knowing your fire department, and I think some of the some of the speakers talk about exercising with them, inviting them. Do they know the type of research that you are doing? You know, do they know that if they need to evacuate your animals, you know, what type of potential infectious diseases can affect them? And, uh, and it's still, you know, keeping your animals safe. You know, uh, are you doing bio three or bio four? Uh, you know, like type of research and if there's an incident you know do your you know people in your area people your first responders do they know how to how to enter a facility how to handle this type of incidents so it's important to know you know like basically outline you know what are the tasks that you are going to be carry on when you are implementing your contingency plan and and again here is one of the things that you know you can have a very simple contingency plan but you do still need to address and you have basically answered those four questions in the contingency plan a contingency rule for each one of the incidents that you might actually experience let's go to the next slide please so when we when we talk about who I think one of the one of the main issues that we have observed when when we are looking at the contingency contingency planning in many facilities is that there is sometimes not a clear specific chain of command of who is going to be doing what. So one of the things that we always recommend is primarily to focus on the actual position rather than in the actual person we do have a lot of turnover in many, many facilities. So if you put uh, Mr. Smith as the one who is gonna be in charge of implementing the plan, but Mr. Smith has left, then your plan is not complete. But if you put the manager of operations as the person who is gonna be implementing the plan, that is a much uh, generalized, and you know you don't have to be updating your plan every three months if you lose people or anything like that. The other situation with this, uh, with this who is uh, what type of training, and here's again where we, we look at the what the regulation asks you to do, but what is a good practice to do. So for example, how many of your staff, and this is something that we don't require for you to do, you know, but to basically use uh, incident command sister system as, as a way to train how and who is going to be implementing what, you know, these this type of actions. So, but it's in, important, again, to determine who is in charge and who is in charge of every single step. You know, that chain of command is primarily uh, through, through what the national uh, response frame is, is indicating. And uh, <clears throat> So, um, so it's important again to be familiar with the national response framework, and the fact that incidents are always addressed at the lowest level. But again, Katrina, as I mentioned before, taught us that these incidents can rapidly expand. 
And again, animal care does not require for you to have people trained in ICS, but it won't hurt you. It won't hurt your staff, you know, and ICS is the command system. And it, will, it won't hurt for you and your staff to actually be familiar with an emergency management, how it works, especially during the time when the incidents expand and expand to the level that actually other areas in your other other sections, other units in your community will also be activated. Um, let's go to the next uh, next slide, please. So here is probably the the the, the part you know like that is uh, is one of the most important things. And how will you make this to happen? Here we're talking about logistics. What are the things, the requirements that you need? You know uh, how. You know how is the big question, and 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 the stuff that you need to get uh, done, you know, in order to accomplish your plan, and then uh, so it also includes that recovery phase. So, for example, if you need to evacuate your animals when you bring them back, that recovery portion of bringing them back into your facility, checking that your facilities is still well, and especially if 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 you have to evacuate let's say because of a fire or because of a tornado or things like that. You know, those are the type of things that you need to start considering and to how you will successfully um, develop your plan. Okay. Um, and I am seeing something, okay, thank you. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. I'm going to give yes. you a warning. You're going a little over. So if you could wrap it up in a, the next couple of minutes. Thank yes, you. I will. Thank you. OK, so if we can. Um, so again, the, the, the plan, the planning is just basically is a living document. So just exercising your plan and basically maintaining that communication, knowing where everybody, you know, everybody knows where your plan is in case of an emergency. So that plan doesn't sit on a desk and nobody has access to that. So I think those are the important things. Um, let's go to the next slide. And we already, you know, many of the speakers already talk about training and responsibilities. You know, the training, basically all new employees, they need to be trained within 30 days. and. I, we have heard about the challenges that many of these, uh, many of many of the um, speakers have talked about the challenges that they have had with the, with with having to train people in within the 30 days. But right now, that is that is what the regulation requires. And also, every time you change, when you do the revision of your plan and you change your plan, then you have to train everybody as well. And if we can go to the next slide. And these are primarily just resources. So, and uh, so I believe these slides are going to be shared. Uh, there are many resources uh, for you to to be able to use, and uh, and and to primarily look at how how other units, other um, facilities actually create uh, contingency planning. And um, and then we can go to the last slide, please. And again, this is also at the animal care website. We have a uh, contingency um, technox that you can actually use, and uh, and you can use our website primarily to to look into more information on the on the contingency rule. And I think, uh, let me see. You can go. These are additional resources, and I think with that we are done. So that will be my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, anybody can use Slido to submit questions for any of our speakers. We'll get to a question and answer period after our next couple of speakers. Up next is Mr. Tom Lentz. He is the Senior Director of Facility Management for John Hopkins Healthcare Corporation. So he'll be speaking to that role. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for having me today uh, to talk a little bit about facilities impact and uh, contingency planning and really what goes in before it's contingency planning. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, just a little bit today, we'll talk about kind of background information, a little bit about Johns Hopkins, a little bit about myself and uh, my involvement here uh, at Johns Hopkins with this process. 
Uh, we'll then identify some of the facilities' involvements in contingency planning, and again, kind of looking at it not just from a when something terrible happens, but how might we take some mitigating steps to prevent that from happening. Uh, and then we'll look at some best practices for those various um, uh, various items, and then uh, just follow up with some takeaways at the end. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, so Johns Hopkins, uh, we really have a three-part mission focusing on research, teaching, and patient care. So uh, we do receive quite a bit of NIH funding in 2022. It was over $550 million. I'm not going to read all of these statistics. We do have a lot of labs, more than 900 of them and more than 650 PIs. Uh, and we do have on our site uh, both animal areas, but also some BSL and ABSL3 uh, labs as well. Next slide. Personally, uh, I've been at Johns Hopkins for nearly 25 years. I have spent most of my time on the healthcare side of Johns Hopkins and on the patient care mission. Uh, while we do have some smaller research facilities within our healthcare buildings, uh, my focus has been predominantly on uh, that in the healthcare setting uh, in all that time. Uh, however, in uh, 2019, part of my personal responsibility became Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, which happens to be physically located right across the street, literally one street from the hospital, uh, and thus gained a much larger footprint uh, into the research mission and the teaching missions of Johns Hopkins. Uh, and with that, I've been on a you know four year or so journey learning from folks such as uh, you all about uh, the different needs and requirements for working within these settings. Uh, and as uh, Gustavo just mentioned, uh, uh, the incident command system that is stood up by FEMA, uh, I've recently finished my IS 200C uh, certification course, which is a second level basic uh, incident command system. Uh, I've participated in multiple incident command events, uh, one just a few weeks ago. Uh, again, in the healthcare setting, uh, not so much in the research setting, but uh, do have familiarity when we do get to that point that we have to implement uh, incident command, how to participate within incident command and take the roles uh, as they are assigned and, uh, and go with them. Next slide, please. So as we talk about contingency planning, again, some of my focus today is really not at the end when these, these items happen. And, and Gustavo just did a fantastic job walking through the contingency plans. Uh, Johns Hopkins does have them. Uh, and I work very closely with our animal welfare folks, we refer to as research animal resources, uh, and implementing those plans if needed. But, but what to, we're talking about today is some of those other measures we take to uh, kind of contingencies before the contingency. Uh, and so some of the general philosophies we follow as a facilities departments are to first insource expertise as much as we can. Uh, we find that when our folks are employed by us, they're vested in what we do, they're vested in our missions, and uh, therefore we tend to get a better product. Uh, there's less learning curve when there are issues, we tend to be able to respond to situations more quickly. Uh, so while we can't have expertise in every area and there are limitations, we do supplement with contractors uh, where needed. Uh, but we do work with our contractors to have consistent staff. And when new staff come on board, they are trained in all of our protocols uh, surrounding working uh, in, in animal areas. Uh, we do run a robust preventive maintenance program. Again, it's, it's key to stave off having uh, emergencies if your equipment is running properly. And then we believe in layered redundancies, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a bit. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the high level of the different uh, areas we're going to talk about today. Uh, I know that uh, Brian talked a lot about electrical. I unfortunately wasn't able to catch all of everybody's presentation. I, I caught kind of the tail end of, uh, of Brian's, but uh, electrical is surely a big issue that we have. And then uh, HVAC is another. Uh, next slide, please. So as we refer to uh, HVAC, uh, we, we really talk about how do we create an environment that is conducive for animal welfare, uh, and, and so we always look to have temperature and humidities in range uh, for our animals and those folks working in those areas. Uh, pressure relationships, which for us falls under HVAC, it's really that kind of the, the V part, the ventilation to make sure that uh, we have air moving in the right directions uh, so that we're creating protective environments uh, so that we do not have cross-contamination uh, and also that we're keeping staff safe that are not working in those areas that are a little bit higher uh, of risk. And then we do have, as I mentioned, some high containment facilities on campus. 
those are uh, battle tested at least once a year to uh, to do full shutdowns. Uh, next slide, please. Got a little bit ahead of myself, uh, but so how do we how do we take some steps in contingency planning uh, for HVAC? Number one is to have as many redundant systems as possible. There are obviously financial limitations to that. So one example of that are air handling units with what we refer to as fan arrays. Uh, and while we do not have these everywhere, kind of our new engineering design principles utilize fan arrays. So instead of having one giant fan and air handling unit or a small large fans. Uh, to have a lot of smaller fans, and you can get to an N plus one or even N plus two situation where if you do lose a single fan, it does not wreak havoc on the system. It does not create that emergency situation. Uh, additionally, on top of fan arrays, we do have some uh, cross-connect duct work so that one air handling unit can uh, protect or, or assist another if it is having issues. Uh, so that is a best practice that we try to employ when we can. Alarming is critically important, and in a facilities world, it's it's important to be able to decipher between nuisance alarming and real alarming. Uh, so there are those most critical of alarms that not only trigger in the system, but are dialed out uh, to people that need to take action on them. It sounds trivial, it sounds uh, basic, but it is frequently not done well. And we have spent, I've spent the last four years, uh, particularly with the School of Medicine, really trying to better understand our alarming and to make sure the right people are getting the right alarms at the right time so that we're being as effective with our manpower as we can. I got a little bit ahead of myself, but we do do full testing of our high containment facilities. Uh, that is a full shutdown scenario to make sure that all the systems respond the way that they should. Uh, there are always full exhaust redundancies in the high containment areas. Uh, one protects the other, um, but if both goes down, it also slams the supply shut uh, to create at worst a neutral environment, uh, which is again, a protective environment for all. Uh, we always look to have adequate inventory of supplies on hand, uh, you know, during the COVID time and the supply chain crisis, it taught us how important as ever it was to have those adequate materials on hand that we needed. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, in-house expertise and constant training on our equipment uh, for our folks to make sure that we are able to resolve problems as quickly as possible when they do occur. Next slide, please. One item that I will tell you I, I personally hadn't thought about a lot uh, until the last couple of years was the impact that pests uh, pose to our animal welfare. Uh, pests such as obacati, which can um, actually not only impact animals, but also impact uh, humans, and they can carry various pathogens. Uh, how do these uh, mites get into our campus? Also, how, to, how do stray or city rodents get into our campus? And then birds do also present us a problem. Uh, all of these are risks to animal welfare. And if you could, next slide. Uh, some of the measures that we suggest, uh, some that we have not been able to uh, necessarily implement, but are looking to for future construction, uh, one is always to be mindful where your animal facilities are going. Again, this seems very basic. Uh, but you may not want to, for example, locate one of your primary animal facilities under a loading dock, a loading dock in the middle of a city where there's trash outside and there's constant attraction to outside creatures, uh, rats, mice, whatever it may be. Uh, once they get near your loading dock, you may also not want to have your feed, animal feed stored near the loading dock. Uh, again, when some of these buildings were built 20 plus years ago, I don't think considerations were given uh, at the level that they needed to be. So as we uh, go through schematic design for new buildings, we are looking to move those areas and make sure we have appropriate uh, feed storage areas and bedding storage areas. To the extent that you are in a situation where your animal facility might not be in the most ideal location, how do you try to prevent against that? Uh, penetrations are our worst nightmare. Uh, so vertical penetrations from one floor to another or horizontal penetration. Uh, trying to find those cracks and crevices as we know these pests and mites can get into small areas and can traverse throughout the building uh, quite easily. So it is difficult to fill in all of those gaps, uh, but we work very tightly with our pest management experts. Uh, we facilities are not experts in pests. I, 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 am not, I do not carry that degree. And so we rely heavily upon them to guide us as to what we need to do and then to solve those problems. And it's a constant state of find problem, fix it, find problem, fix it until the problem uh, becomes better. 
and then last but not least, always having easily cleanable surfaces because uh, cleanliness is the enemy to uh, insects, pests, and uh, rodents. Next slide, please. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, electrical really is a, one of the biggest problems that we face as an institution and to animal welfare because small electrical problems can turn into much bigger problems. Uh, we go back to HVAC, it all runs by electricity, so we need to make sure that there's power always going there. Uh, pumps, you know, things that you don't always think about, these are not just H stuff, pumps for HVAC, but even your fuel pumps or your generators. How do you ensure that they have appropriate power at all times? Uh, we learned that during Superstorm Sandy up in uh, New York, where the, the generators were great and they had plenty of fuel, but if your fuel pumps can't get your fuel to where it needs to go, uh, then your generators can't run. Uh, and then the impact on the ventilation within the cage racks is also vitally important. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the measures that we take, uh, one, making sure that you have generators, that they are tested routinely and that they are operating properly. Uh, secondly, is making sure that only the most critical of equipment is connected to your emergency power outlets. Uh, too often, people make self decisions as to what should be on emergency power. And there are some things that just do not need to be on emergency power. So being uh, um, selective with the items that go on emergency power versus those that do not. Uh, providing un uninterruptible uninter power supplies or UPSs to critical equipment. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a misunderstanding for many folks, uh, but when things are on generator power, it doesn't mean you always have power. Uh, if you lose normal power at the outlet, it does take generally between five and 10 seconds for the generators to come online, synchronize and provide power to that outlet. If you have sensitive equipment, uh, and that falls under various categories, computers, uh, controllers for HVAC equipment, uh, whatever it may be, they are going to lose power for five to 10 seconds unless you provide a UPS or again, uninterruptible power supply, which essentially acts as a battery for those few seconds and gets over that hump. It buffers until the power is available back to that outlet. Uh, all too often, we have people you know, yelling at us saying that, you know, I had this plugged in the red outlet, why did I lose power? and we have to explain to them uh, the reasons for that. And then lastly, from an energy perspective, we are a little bit fortunate on this campus, and I surely would suggest best practice for others if available, uh, that our campus is fed from two uh, electrical substations from our utility. And the vast majority of our building substations are what we refer to as double-ended, meaning that they actually have two different power sources going to them, and if one did fail, it could flip to another. Uh, and so we do utilize that as uh, I talked a little bit about the layering approach. So we've got uh, generators, but also that our substations are double ended coming from different substations. Uh, so we've tried to build those layers of redundancy into our electrical systems. Uh, next slide, please. Purified water systems, obviously it's important for, uh, for animal welfare that uh, the animals have the correct water that they need to drink based on you know, what the requirements are for the research and or the animal. Uh, and so from a facilities perspective, we have source equipment that provides RO and or DI water uh, into a loop based system. Uh, the different labs may require water polishers based on what they're doing to get a higher quality of water. Uh, we, we do not send the highest quality of water out for most of the research, the quality that we send out uh, is enough but you, uh, some do need to have more uh, higher quality. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some of the, the items or some of the tasks that we embark upon, uh, I've talked a lot about our preventive maintenance program. So making sure that we have in-house expertise on the equipment and that our contractors are here and routinely providing uh, the work on the systems. Uh, to provide redundancies where possible, so we do have crossover connections from some of our source equipment to others, so that if one does fail, we can fill the tanks from others. Uh, proactive evaluation, this is an interesting one. Uh, we've learned, especially acutely in the last couple of years, that uh, piping doesn't last forever. Uh, we've had quite a few blowouts, and when blowouts happen, not only do they make a mess for your areas, but you also deplete your tanks and thus could provide or could create a situation to animal welfare that is not uh, of interest. Uh, and then obviously having ample supply of backup supplies 
available. That is both for equipment as well as whatever may need it, be needed for the animals if we do have a sustained outage of the purified uh, water system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of my colleagues have spoken about natural disasters. Uh, you know, I, I think in the state of Maryland, when we're located, we surely get those really hot, humid days in the middle of summer where you're touching uh, more than 100 degrees. And we do get a lot of humidity here, particularly in the summer. Uh, so how do you have your HVAC equipment set up to ha handle that? Uh, snow is an interesting one in Maryland. Uh, knock on wood, we've not had issues the last few years. It's most likely the kiss of death and we'll have a major snowstorm this year. But, uh, you know, from a, a Maryland perspective, you know, a few inches of snow really can bollocks us up, right? We, we handle, you know, one, two, three inches okay. More than that, it can really cause issues for us. And uh, a number of years ago, we did actually have a blizzard where we took on four feet of snow uh, and, and it was a nightmare. Baltimore City shut down. Uh, it was very difficult to get things in and out. Uh, so how do you prepare for that? Uh, and then fire, while we do not have a lot of wildfires, equipment fires do happen. Uh, we unfortunately did have one a, a number of years ago where a transformer caught on fire. Uh, so how do you how do you plan for that? Uh, next slide, please. Some of this feels uh, a little bit redundant, but uh, making sure you have redundant utilities available when you can would really be a best practice. Uh, having your folks available to know how to switch over to your backup systems uh, when needed. We do continually monitor weather. Uh, we actually have a command center that has, uh, let's see, eight, nine, 10, 11 screens. Uh, one of them is always the weather. Uh, so we're, anytime we walk by, we can see if there are any storms popping up that could create us a problem, whether it's a water a rainstorm or if it is a, a snowstorm. Uh, having emergency water removal equipment. Uh, so this is an interesting one based on experience that we learned uh, that while we had we thought every contingency in place and we had water removal equipment. Uh, when we took on a deluge of water, it was, I think, 10 to 12 inches of water in, in a very short amount of time, like an hour and a half. Uh, there were some issues and we did not have uh, the level of equipment that we need. And from a facilities perspective, uh, always be prepared to be a driver. We have a fleet of vehicles. They're all four wheel drive. And when critical people need to get to the campus, we need to be willing to go out in our vehicles and uh, pick people up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do have a, a farm facility. Uh, I don't know if others have them, uh, but it is physically disparate from the campus. It's it's about 40 miles away from the campus, and thus there are less resources available. So how do you contingency plan for that? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one is emergency generators. Again, some of this seems redundant. Um, having more supplies than ever because it is kind of isolated. There's not a Home Depot or a Lowe's nearby, or you know, if you would need a warehouse or a specialized equipment vendor, uh, parts vendor, they're not nearby. So making sure you have an ample uh, inventory of critical supplies and parts on hand at all times is vitally important. Uh, and then, as I just mentioned, be prepared to be a driver. Uh, whoever needs to get to that facility or get from that facility that we have a means with which to get them there or back. Next slide, please. So uh, really my main takeaways from this, uh, really, folks should really look at your facilities department as a strategic partner. I, I know a lot of times we uh, seem to be barriers and we seem to make life more difficult, but the reason for that is we do have experience uh, in building systems and in HVAC and electrical and we want to partner with you. We don't want to be an enemy. We want to collaborate. And uh, we ask you to do that anytime that there are alterations uh, to, to room use, whatever it may be, whether it's in an ABSL or BSL3 lab or in a satellite housing facility, uh, talk to us. You know, one example we've been dealing with a lot lately, there's a, a movement to a lot of self-contained biosafety cabinets. Well, when you pull out a ducted biosafety cabinet that it uses a lot of exhaust air, if you don't design and plan properly for that exhaust air, you've now created a situation where the air is so negatively strong, you might not be able to open doors. Uh, and, and so it's kind of basic things like that that folks don't always think about, and they think they're moving to a better best practice. And we can provide value there in uh, planning for new spaces when planning for new equipment. Uh, and then my last slide when going, or my last bullet here, when going through contingency planning uh, and thinking outside your organization, uh, I referenced a large storm that we had to deal with. And while everything we had within our buildings was fantastic and working well, the area of elevation that was lowest on campus, uh, unfortunately, the Baltimore City stormwater system was so overwhelmed, we started taking on water from the city 
because it couldn't handle it. Uh, and it was a multi-million dollar uh, disaster for us. A lot of research loss, a lot of manual work to get animals out and relocated. And uh, it's just one of those things that while you think you're self-contained within your uh, your island and you've built all these contingencies and redundancies that we've talked about, sometimes there are external influences that uh, we don't always think about right away, but that can impact us. Uh, and so, you know, for that one specifically, it's getting a much larger diesel powered water movement pump uh, to try to get water away from the campus uh, when that happens. Uh, so I spoke a little bit quickly, tried to make up a little bit of time here. Uh, I thank you all so much for your opportunity to the, for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I think we'll have Q&A here coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We have one more speaker this morning before Q&A. Uh, Mr. Roger Lafier is a 24 four-year Coast Guard veteran and has served in several emergency management positions since his retirement. All right. Uh, got to share my screen, so stand by. Okay, so I was asked to discuss how to integrate with the emergency response partners and uh, hold on a second, let me get it up to the slideshow presentation. And uh, just to give you a little background, uh, Coast Guard, I spent most of my life as an emergency responder. Uh, I am currently an emergency medical technician for the lab I work at, and also a hazmat, volunteer hazmat person for the community. And you can see why that may be helpful later on. So how do we do that? How do we get folks involved? Well, you've seen a lot of this, I'm sure already with some of the previous speakers. And I just wanna say that, um, you know, working with Tom and listening to others, I think we're really greatly in the sync with each other. Yeah. So um, anyways, you'll see right here, uh, this is not anything new, but again, you wanna follow this uh, cycle. I, I've actually integrated the normal planning cycle with how you might use this cycle for working with partners, right? So the first thing you wanna start with is your risk assessment, right? And y'all know how to do that. And then you look at what your capabilities are, you know, when you have gaps in your risk assessment and so on and so forth. Uh, you identify any emergency response needs. And, and this doesn't have to be necessarily emergency responders. I mean, I heard Tom talk a lot about it, getting outside resources and generators and folks that are, you know, have facility expertise from other facilities. That can be stuff that you might be looking at as well. Reinforce relationships, really important. You got to have that in your planning cycle. You will not see this in any other planning cycle except this one, because to me, all incidents are about relationships. Anybody want kids to argue with that with me? I'd be happy to, but it's absolutely true. And then you do tabletop exercise. We heard that from some of the other uh, presenters. You revise your plan, right? Change the plan. And then we do some kind of a live exercise, a real incident maybe that happens by happenstance. You don't plan for those. And we rise the plan again, and then we go through the cycle all over. But this is really what I'm going to talk about today, is how do we reinforce relationships and making sure we get emergency responders inside and outside your organization integrated in the planning process. Uh, so one of the things I focus on is the national preparedness elements. Uh, this is from the National Preparedness Doctrine, uh, which is, I know it's kind of old, but it's still in effect, uh, 2011. And it looks at risk assessments, estimating capabilities, building and sustaining capabilities, planning, exercise, after action review. So a lot of folks are under the misconception you develop the plan first. That's really not true. You got to do a risk assessment. You got to see what your internal capabilities are. And then you got to build and sustain those. And then you do planning and exercise. And of course, I heard somebody mention earlier how important an after action review is. So we're going to focus on really these uh, elements, not necessarily talk about uh, after action reviews, because these are the elements that we're interested in when we're building partnerships with our internal and external emergency uh, personnel. By the way, this is our laboratory with a uh, wildfire in the background. Uh, risk assessment, uh, really uh, critical. So whenever you have a deficiency in any of these areas, really got to think about emergency response needs. And again, I don't want to necessarily focus this on just limiting it to the fire police and hazmat and EMS, but also any other uh, outside resources that you might need, emergency generated capabilities, and even FEMA, for example. 
When you do a risk assessment, I would consider uh, getting uh, setting up what you call a security and emergency management committee. Uh, we have representatives from our veterinarian branch and our uh, research uh, folks regarding animals part of the Security Emergency Management Committee. Uh, we uh, meet monthly. We do a continuous risk assessment. A lot of folks will just do one, you know, in one year and then five years will do another one. Well, things change, right? Look at COVID, how that changed our world. So this Security Emergency Management Committee could be stood up uh, and you get everybody integrated in these important issues, including the folks that are doing the animal researches or taking care of the animals. And, uh, you know, you can, again, in risk assessment, you look at hazard, severity, probability, and vulnerability. Uh, the other thing about this committee, which is interesting, it's not just looking at this, but it's looking at all security aspects of a facility, all the emergency management issues that might be associated with facility, oncoming storms and weather, uh, which is a big deal in Montana. And uh, earthquakes recently, we've had an earthquake study that indicates we might be worse off than we thought. So this committee kind of lends itself to uh, doing that. Uh, then you have to prioritize your risks and uh, Rocky Mount Labs, it's uh, earthquake, wildfires, active shooters, cyber attacks, facilities, incidents. You see facility incidents, right? Well, we heard a lot from Tom talking about that. And, you know, those those are really more frequent than the other ones are, I'll be honest with you. And, we take advantage of those to exercise our emergency management team and to exercise our plans and revise those plans accordingly. And when you're doing this, uh, this also informs you uh, what you will need from the outside community, right? So when you've looked at this and you say, well, we can't fight wildfires, you know, we can't really respond to, uh, you know, necessarily earthquakes, we're gonna need some help, right? So this is another way to inform your process. And then you got to estimate your internal capabilities. Do you have a hazmat team? I heard uh, one of the previous speakers mentioning have their own hazmat team. Do you have medical responders? Do you have an incident management team? That manages, do you have crisis action teams? How about a family assistance center? Anybody think about that? Active shooter is now one of the biggest incidents we're concerned about, but do you have a family assistance center? Nursing staff, biosafety staff, general safety staff, these are all part of your internal, could be a part of your internal capabilities, right? And you might have law enforcement available at your facility. You might have fire personnel. Uh, so that's important as well. So you got to integrate these folks. The Security and Emergency Management Committee does a fabulous job in doing that. It integrates all these folks with the science community and the uh, animal research folks and the animal husbandry uh, teams. Now we're gonna talk about external needs, right? These are your folks, your local law enforcement, county, city, state, federal, I say FBI, but FEMA also. Uh, you might have a local fire department does uh, fire and rescue, in case uh, you do have an earthquake and somebody gets stuck in a BSL three or four laboratory. What medical capabilities are in the community? You know, we're, where we live in Montana, we don't have a lot of resources. We have three ambulances that cover an area the size of Rhode Island. Uh, what burn centers do you need potentially, right? A lot of the big cities have these. Uh, we've actually have to helicopter people out to these. Uh, does your hospital have chemical decon capabilities or even decontamination or stabilization abilities to manage biological exposures? And of course, the National Weather Service. I can't think of a hazard, honestly, that they wouldn't be involved with. Um, so you, if you have tornadoes, hurricanes, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, that's going to help you as well. Urban Search and Rescue uh, is a resource that uh, FEMA has set up across the United States. Uh, if you have a major earthquake or just a building collapse or a facility collapse, these guys will actually come out and help you. So it's very important to consider all of these folks. And when you're engaging with folks, it's again, you can invite these external uh, emergency responders to come over to your security and emergency management committee. And then you foster sort of a, a partnership culture, right? And even within the organization, you'll do that as well. So it's nice to have be on a first name basis or attach a face to a laboratory chief or an animal husbandry person or a veterinarian. However, plans. I love this quote by uh, the Honorable President and General Dwight Eisenhower. The plan is nothing. Planning is everything. And what he means by that is the plan is nothing but a piece of paper. It's all it is, or a stack of piece of papers. What goes into the development of the plan is what's key. 
And you remember what I said, relationships, planning is all about relationship. Incident response is all about relationships. You don't have those relationships, you will fail, guaranteed. So don't look at anything in isolation. Don't stick your planner in the corner, write a plan just for the sake of doing it. Get folks involved, your external, internal partners as well. That's why I have in my planning cycle this idea of reinforcing relationships. Uh, and there's a cultural aspects and differences, right? And so you have to really balance perspective. Uh, I heard somebody quote, it's easier to move a planet than change a culture. Um, but you must overcome some of these uh, diverse cultures. So a lot of, uh, you know, hazmat and fire and EMS folks view uh, scientists as these kind of people or these kind of people or these people. I'm being kind of funny here. Um, <clears throat> and the vice versa, right? Three Stooges, Keystone Cops, the Marx Brothers. So we've got to come over with, with these cultural differences and we've got to understand those cultures, right? And it's okay to adapt our personalities to those cultures because we do it with our own families, right? We don't talk to our children like we talk to our peers. We don't talk to our husbands and partners and wives like we talk to our scientists at work. So consider that when you're dealing with these different cultures. If you want to engage your external emergency responders, you have to speak their language. And the language of emergency responders in this country is the incident command system. Absolutely need to understand this system. This is their language, okay? And it was established by the National Incident Management System back right after 9-11 because of the lack of the city of New York to and all the responders just to integrate. And so it's absolutely the language that you need to, if you walk into a meeting and you say, I don't know anything about incident command system or we don't use it, you've lost them. You have lost them. So at Rocky Mountain Labs, we have uh, quite a bit of folks that are trained in this. I actually do the training uh, and, you know, just familiarization training. And then I have a core team that actually knows how to execute the process. If this is unfamiliar to you uh, and you're going to be working with the external partners, please strongly consider uh, you speak the language and learn this language. Appearances are important. This is our, one of our active shooter incidents here. And you can see, uh, again, speaking the language of incident command system, we're actually wearing the vest. Here's a liaison officer. By the way, he's our associate director at the laboratory. Uh, this is our finance section chief, logistics, plans, and so on and so forth. But when the fire guys and the police walk in and they see this, they're like, wow, these guys got it together. We'll be able to integrate with those guys because they understand our language and how we do things out in the community. So we practice this quite quite a lot, honestly, and not just for, you know, your, your typical fire, your mess emergencies, but whenever we have a facility issue, like an autoclave goes down, you all know how that can impact a number of organizations, the research, the animal uh, husbandry folks, it just has a cascading effect. So rather than trying to stovepipe this decision through, we'll set up an incident management team and work through the process. So how do you get this training? Well, there are online FEMA courses that are free that you can take. Uh, you can take courses with partners. I guarantee you that in your community, unless you're really rural, but even our community, we have 4,000 people in Hamilton, Montana. There's somebody doing some kind of ICS training and it's free. And you say, hey man, I'd like to join that training. And they'd be only too happy to see you there because it means you're trying to understand their culture and integrate. And then don't be afraid to participate in some of those exercise or observe exercises. Um, I do a lot of uh, assistance with active shooter exercises in our community and uh, help observe those and provide critique. So again, the more you integrate with their culture and you're, the, allow them to integrate with your culture, you'll be able to merge those two cultures. So how do you get organizations to the table, right? How do you get them to attend these meetings and reinforce those relationships? You need to get out and meet with them. And I'm not just talking about the emergency manager. Like I mentioned, our associate director, he's our liaison officer. So he's actually come out with me. We've met our city emergency manager. Uh, we met them at their facility, you know, uh, because it's, it's more polite to do that. You know, we want to come and visit you unless they want to come and visit you and you can give them a tour. But you want some lab folks with you. Emergency manager can only do so much. But if you show somebody 
uh, that, you know, here's the lead scientist uh, that's coming to visit with me. It absolutely makes uh, it makes a huge difference. I give them a tour for the of your facility, kind of takes some mystique out of what you're doing. Attend what's called the local emergency planning committee meetings, LEPCs. Uh, these were established under the Comprehensive Environmental Resource Conservation Liability Act, CERCLA, aka Superfund. Um, as a result of uh, extremely hazardous substances, uh, by law, local communities have to form and uh, meet uh, with these local emergency planning committees. And um, they have extremely hazardous substances. And guess what? A lot of, there's a lot of biologicals, biopathogens in that list. So you may not be aware of it, but they're actually having these meetings. Get out and attend these meetings. Listen to what they have to say. And if it's not you, maybe somebody else can go in your stead. But Rocky Mountain Labs, where I work, is always somebody there to listen and become in the process and so that they know, oh, these guys really care about our community and they want to help our community. The local emergency manager in your community, whether it's city, state, county, is your resource broker. When you're setting up these meetings, you need to go through them. You know, that you don't want to bypass the emergency manager. You go through them and say, hey, man, I'd like to set up a meeting with the uh, fire chief. Can you help me with that? Sure. And a lot of times they want to come along with you. Uh, same with the police chief, same with the local hospitals, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and then make time, you know, absolutely, if you do a tour for your facility, make time for a sit down and, and have that own informal discussion. Um, firemen, police, EMS folks don't like PowerPoint. So you can provide them some of that stuff, but give them hands on and then take the time after your tour or beginning say, okay, we're just gonna have a sit down. What do, you, what do you wanna know about our laboratory? What, you know, is there anything that you don't understand or you're concerned about? That's the kind of thing that these folks wanna do. Again, uh, more FaceTime. FaceTime is more important, okay, than anything else when you're dealing with emergency responders. The more important, do not send them emails, to avoid Zoom meetings, uh, these kind of presentations, get and be with there with them. Sit down with them. They really appreciate FaceTime because that's how they work. They work by FaceTime. Um, so it's really, really critical that you do that. And if you have any, what I call swag, anything to offer them, like coffee cups or whatever, they always appreciate that. They love that stuff, the firemen, um, police, and so on and so forth. But, you know, go out and see their drills. Watch the hazmat team and offer us how how they drill for fire departments on how police might work uh, an active shooter case. So how do I get plan? How do I get plan input? This is a really big challenge for any emergency planner or contingency planner. But keep in mind that the emergency response community responds and they do not draft, they do not read and they don't exercise plans. So if you send them a plan and by email and send it to them, they will not read it. And if they say they did, they'll forget it the next day. That's not what they do. So how do we get the, them involved in the planning process? It's important, to, first of all, to identify those things that are in the plan that are pertinent to each, each organization, right? Everything else to an emergency responder is less important. You don't care how many animals you have. How many autoclaves? He just wants to know, how do I put out that fire? Where can I you know, interdict somebody that might be uh, doing an active shooter attack? So you can see, for example, here's our plan and we've outlined some areas where we need to get them involved, right? So I'll take these pieces of information, I'll sit down and I'll meet with them, take notes, but I'll never hand them a piece of paper. Develop a list of questions ahead of time. You know, what is it that you want to, uh, to do, and maybe you don't know, maybe you don't know. So you say, hey, I have a fire in this facility. Um, how would you guys handle that the fire department? And they may have questions for you. Well, what's in there? What's safe, what's safe and unsafe? And how do we work together to make this happen? And you take that information down. And I particularly like somebody that's an assistant that can take notes while I'm talking to these folks. And then I can ask the questions and have the dialogue, right? Now, this is the way I'm getting the plan input. And it's efficient and effective for that community. Always meet with them live. You heard me say that already, you know, avoid Zooms and Teams unless we have another pandemic and it's required. 
and then ask the questions. Have someone take notes, like I just said. Have sincere discussions and make sure you avoid acronyms as much as you can. Uh, that way they understand what you're really referring to. Even when you say biosafety level three, they don't know what that is, or four. Um, you, you've got to kind of describe that to them and make sure they understand what that means. Then once you get their input, then you can go ahead and complete a draft of the plan based on the input you received. Okay. And that's important. As we heard from others, you conduct the tabletop uh, exercise. You bring all the police and fire there. They are not going to read the plan. So what you need to do is make sure that you understand what their role is. And you can say, for example, okay, fire chief, this is where you come in as we discussed, and you would do this. And maybe he forgot about that, or maybe he didn't, but he's gonna provide you feedback, that's correct. Now I can check that off in my draft plan, right? So that's the kind of, that's the whole point really to have these, uh, these kind of a tabletops discussion. You really build some really great relationships when you do this. Because now you're seeing a team effort. Don't forget the coffee and the donuts. I know that's a joke with police officers, and but it is important to buy the coffee. And as a federal government representative, I can't use government funds for that. I pay out of pocket because I know how important that is, especially if you want to have them come to another meeting. Okay. Then you can revise your plan, right? You have the tabletop exercise, you built those relationships. Now you can revise your plan, okay? And then the expectation is the plan owner advises all the emergency response resources to respond based on the plan, okay? So here's an example of a planning section chief, which is a role I fulfill on the incident management system. And then I'll go and, you know, when an incident happens, uh, you know, we give them copies of the plan, whatever, but for the most part, we say, okay, we have a fire in this building, fire safety, you're gonna be doing this. Uh, you know, biotechs, you're gonna be doing this. Maintenance, you're gonna shut off this, this, and this. Fire, this is where we had you coming in. Oh yeah, 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 that's right, yep. And again, you're getting feedback on developing that plan and revising it. When you write a plan, just in case they read it, and I would say not all of them don't read it, but for the most part, uh, unless you're in a big city, sometimes they have a, a planners that work for the police and fire and so on and so forth. But you need to have your plan. It's written like it's action oriented because these folks are all about honestly dealing with action oriented items. And I'll give you an example of that. All right. Your plans are not training documents. Do not have anything about training in there. That's not what they are. So often I say, well, you know, this is this is what a BSL4 lab is. Doesn't need to be in there. Okay, that's in some other document. Okay, uh, it's not a tre treatise on the organization's doctrine or mission statement, which is often in there. And it's not excessively verbose description of roles, responsibilities, and organizational processes. So let's look at an example. This is the beginning of our emergency response plan at Iraqi Mount Labs. You can see it's very, very basic, right? It's to the point. Talks about calling uh, dialing zero. Talks about the incident command system, as I mentioned earlier. So you got to keep it simple. Now, this is another plan I actually saw about animals. What's the difference? I mean, I don't even have to show you. I can't use this plan. And this is an older plan that we had at Rocky Mountain Labs until I revised it. It doesn't really tell me what to do. In the middle of a crisis, I can't do this. I want this previous format so I can follow along checklist by checklist. Doesn't mean you don't have to, you can't have this somewhere like in the appendix or whatever, but the core of the plan has to be actionable. And that's going to help with your partners too. Okay. And then you have a live exercise or a real incident. Uh, you get the team together. You can see this is Roaring Lion Fire, which was the fastest wildfire ever developed in the U.S. history about a mile or so away from our laboratory. Um, you know, we got our incident management team together. And by the way, you can see police here. You can see engineers here. You can see myself here. You can see our, our maintenance crews over here. All there's our IT person over here, all integrated on getting ready to plan for this major incident that could overrun the lab. Once you have those kind of things, you go ahead and revise your plan and put a date on it. 
And then you begin the cycle all over again. You start the process all over again. So uh, we'll save the questions for later, but that's my presentation. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. And remember, it's all about a team effort when you have incidents that involve our outsiders. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. We're gonna invite all our speakers from this morning back on for our question and answer period. Margaret, Landy and I will be asking all your questions. So if you have one, get them in Slido now. Um, I'll start with Brian gave a comment for active shooter assailant events. Um, you might want to consider purchasing Stop the Bleed kits. Yeah, so this was something we added to our contingency plan. These were actually sadly developed by Medline post uh, the Sandy Hook event. Um, so it's something, again, we purchased them rather inexpensive, but um, something to consider putting into your plan. Um, I have a question for the, the speakers, but before that, I just want to check. We're going till noon today, or are we going later for our Q&As? 12.10? Okay. That depends on how many questions I'll ask. Okay, so the question is, um, do you need to have the internal first response team certified with a city or state municipal group? And does the city need to approve the internal group to enter the building during an emergency? Uh, I'm not sure which speaker would answer this best, so I'll throw it out. I there. can I can take a shot at it. Maybe Brian and some of the others can jump in. So, because I am a hazmat responder, so it's going to depend on where you live, right? So, because we're a federal facility, we have to find uh, follow the OSHA standard for hazardous waste and oil operations, which is 1910-120, and uh, Actually, all of the hazmat teams should be following that. But some jurisdictions, like California, for example, will have additional requirements, state requirements for you to operate. Now, if you're operating within your facility lines, you might not have to have that uh, state certification requirement, but you should absolutely have a dialogue with the state of California to make sure you're meeting their requirements. And so your local state, normally the local community won't have their own standards, and correct me if I'm wrong, other panel members, but you do have to meet the OSHA HAZWAPA requirements. Again, uh, 29 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 19120, 19, sorry. And uh, you do have to meet those requirements, or you could be cited by OSHA. So I'll turn it over to Brian or uh, Katya or anybody else for the comments. Yeah. I'm I would echo that, Roger. It really comes down to working with your EHS team, your local fire department. But there's, I mean, from our perspective here at AbbVie, there's no certification done. It's more of business continuity and making sure that everybody's aware of what's going on and then following the applicable standards. Obviously, I'm in Illinois. AbbVie's got sites in California. As I'm integrating more with them, I'm learning some of these unique state differences, I'll call it, that I had never thought of. Thank you. Our next question is for Katia. How can EHS considerations be addressed if the organization is small or does not have in house expertise to assess risk of chemical, biological, and radio radiological risk broadly? Thank you. Yes, especially for smaller institutions where you may have one person who's a generalist that has to cover many areas, you may not have the in house. Uh, in-depth expertise to evaluate those areas. And I would recommend uh, working with either a local consultant uh, that can that has that expertise or a lot of uh, external service providers. There might be uh, other institutions that you can partner with uh, to, to share information and, and develop or obtain that expertise to support the development of your plans. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the panel. And um, how has the USDA contingency rule specifically altered the roles, responsibilities, or the workload of your unit or program you've been speaking about? It's open to the panel. I'll start first. On our side, no, no real impact. I mean, we already kind of checked all those boxes, and I would say we're well ahead of the curve with 
Ab the legacy Abbott philosophy on preparation for the infamous Y2K. Thank you. And I would just add, I think it's it's kind of brought us close together to uh, those folks that deal specifically with that agency. So they they have come to me, kind of step forward, leaning forward, saying, "Hey, you know, what can you do to help us out in this particular area?" Thanks. It's good to hear. Thanks. It's good to hear. All right, over to Carrie. Our next question is also for the panel. Are there any strategies that can help minimize lapses in communication between the various organizational units during an incident? Again, I think it comes back to having that site command set up and having a fixed point of contact from the start of the event or even the preparation for the event. You know, I'm thinking back when we had the blizzard, you know, we were planning two and three days before it ever got here. And then that point of contact is fluid until the event is completed. And it's not like, well, I started and then I hand it off to another manager because they're, uh, you know, on site with me. It's if I'm starting, I'm the point of contact and everybody disseminates information back out to their respective units. But you get those key stakeholders identified relative to discipline in the organization. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. And Brian, you said it really well. You know, part of the using the incident command system is the incident management team is you follow a specific planning process for emergencies and it really has very rigid meanings and communication protocols and you know summaries of information and action items list that that you can send out to everybody and one of the key roles of the emergency manager is to make sure that information does flow out to everybody and in my case facilitate that process and so we find you know, having the emergency manager step back, and I'm a qualified incident commander and planning sector chief and IC, it probably doesn't mean anything to you folks, but but that allows me to run the process as long as they trust me and say, hey, I'm going to run this process. You need to buy into it and let me do this, and I'll tell you what to do. Because you're not going to train 500, 400 scientists on how to do this, but if they can agree to developing those processes and really... The system was set up because in 1973, 13 firefighters died. They were trained, well-equipped. They were experts, but they died because of communication. So ICS is really a communication tool to make sure everybody's safe. But Brian, all the high points uh, Brian hit is, is part of that mechanism. I, I agree with these, uh, with Brian and Roger as well, uh, that the span of control and unity control is defined, yep. by, defined by the incident command system really uh, allows for targeted communication so it's not so broad and not so narrow and then it trickles down uh, as it needs to so if the, the system is followed it tends to work well uh, to get the communication where it needs to I think the other thing that I would add is um, we're all educated at some level some people are smart at this thing some at that thing just because you are the top person in this field doesn't make you a good incident commander um, so we're all good at different things and really understanding your role during incident command is vitally important, uh, not to overstep uh, and yeah. also to be engaged for the role that you have been assigned if you have a role in that system. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, would, Thanks for I, would, in. I will also mention that it's not only the internal communication as part of the ICS system, but it's also the external communication with your partners. So basically the liaison position, you know, the, the it's the one is one of the primary and important positions that you have to basically train someone because those are the yes. ones who are going to be making those connections with the fire departments, with other institutions, you know, who might be involved in in, in part of an incident. So again, that communication goes external and it goes internal through the system that you just mentioned. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I hope I'm saying your, night, uh, your name right, Dr. Soberano. And it's key It's key that not only external, but internal, right? You have employees. An ambulance shows up at our lab. Rumors start to fly around, right? So you do have to have that person that's trained uh, that not only does external communications, but internal communications as well, um, because it is all about uh, communications in, in the end. So thanks for that comment. Great one. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions for the panelists, but uh, who've been speaking, but I'm going to ask one question that came in uh, tied to Tracy's presentation. And that is, what do you see as the IACUC's primary role in the contingency plan? Thank you for that question. Um, speaking from our experience at UNC Chapel Hill, I think the, the IACUC's primary response is to look at the initial plan, uh, verify that the animal welfare regulation requirements are met, and then um, serve the role of reviewing that on a regular basis with the semi-annual program review being the perfect opportunity when there's um, key leadership, the institutional official, attending veterinarian, safety, um, all the key players present. Thank you, Tracy. Our next question is for anybody. How do you measure the effectiveness of your unit or program's involvement in contingency planning? Roger, you mean the way you measure your plan is really through your uh, your exercises, right? So if you have a tabletop exercise, you can kind of evaluate how well you succeeded and your field exercise. But a, a real com Real important component to that is having observers there. You know, and who invite anybody from this group, this audience, to come and observe what you're doing and give you some feedback. Because if you have those observers, you can really measure the success of your plan. And then have your plan be broad enough that it covers just any eventuality. So we had a flood where it went into BSL3 lab, you know, and you could see how that will affect the research. The, do we have to relocate the animals? How are we going to fix this? And, you know, we talked about the IACUC. I hope I'm saying that right. They were on the, they were listening, you know, because they should be, you know, to make sure that there's not something that we're missing. So, and that's the another six decks, right? So those three things, and then you can go back and, um, you know, you can fix your plan. So you need to you need to really test your plan. The best way to do it is tabletops or live exercises. And also remember, you know, the regulation asks you to review your plans on a yearly basis. So basically that is another option also to look at the effect, you know, how efficient it is. But also, you know, in, in the case of an incident or something, after action reviews are such an important point because they are going to be incorporating whatever happens, whatever you didn't do right into your new plan. That is so important. Thank you for that. I'll follow on with that by saying, take those after action items and put them in an action list. So I mentioned that security emergency management committee. We review all the action items from our incidents and tabletops every month. And you use the team's planning tool. It automatically notifies people. I don't know if you're familiar with that tool. It automatically yep. notifies them. There's no excuse for them not to be ready to discuss that. Um, but it's not a punitive thing. It's more like, okay, what are you doing? And what are your roadblocks? And how can we fix that particular item? Too often, the after-action report kind of gets put on the shelf, what the plan does. But have a system to make sure that you're following through with those corrections. But thanks, sir. Doctor, thanks for bringing that up. Because it's absolutely key, that after-action. This, thank you. And this question's uh, again for the panel. Have you worked with state or local health departments with a medical reserve corps to assist with resources in the specialized training needed for needed for CBRN responses? What what's CBRN? CBRN. Sorry. It's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear. So I don't directly, that's coming more from the corporation side, and then it funnels down through the organization as applicable. I just want to make sure I understood what the acronym was. Yeah, so we at Rocky Mountain Labs, we are required by local law to conduct an exercise annually where we transport a patient with a potential for exposure, maybe coming from overseas research to uh, St. Patrick Hospital, which is two counties up, because they have a capability of stabilizing that patient, which means that we have to get the ambulance to transport them from our own county, 
We have to pick that person up. We have to take them through two other counties. And so as a courtesy, we do get the public health folks involved, you know. And so we do this exercise annually. It's required by law, but we just don't do it by law. We've really seen the value of this and building those partnerships. Because you're right, the ambulance crew shows up. Oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to go near that building. So it's like I told you, you know, you have the biosafety meet, folks meet them up front, you know, with your emergency manager. We're going to take you over here. This is what we're going to do. We're going to describe the right PPE, what protection you're going to have. And by the way, you're going to have somebody with you from biosafety so that you can do your and feel comfortable about it until we get you to the, the receiving end. So I think that's that's one way of looking at it and how you can integrate that particular thing. Now, we do have radioactive sources that get changed out for the same reasons I think a lot of you folks have them. And when we do that, we never know when they're coming, but we we engage with the local community, with the emergency manager. Okay, here's what our plan is. You know, In the event, if there's a release, we're gonna send monitoring teams out here we got hazmat teams involved that have radiation monitoring capability that we can deploy around our facility. Again, that requires a lot of planning ahead of time, but that's a great way, you know, take a look at those opportunities to potentially get folks involved. Thank you. And we'll do one more question. Would you advise small institutions to link with state and local health departments to get ICS training? Again, I'll take a shot at that. So actually, you know, um, the organizations that do ICS really well are uh, the public health organizations, but hospitals. Hospitals have a real good, solid incident command system that's more attuned to what we do. The other groups are universities, but not all universities have used incident command system. Missoula, University of Montana, Missoula does, but I find hospitals have a really good system. In fact, they have a electronic system in Montana that they use where all the hospitals are connected. And so if there's an incident at hospital A, people can see, go online and see what's happening at, at the hospital as far as responding. But yeah, you can get, uh, they do a lot of uh, incident management training, at least in Montana or at our local hospitals and some public health. We find in our our part of the world, I only have two public health officers in the county that's big as uh as big as Rhode Island. So they're overwhelmed and overtaxed in our community, but the hospitals uh, do this all the time. So something to think about. And, I believe and great question. Online resources as well, online training. So you don't necessarily have to partner. I guess we can all argue the value of just doing it online by yourself. It is surely beneficial to do it in a group and be able to collaborate and ask questions, but there are online trainings available. I'm I'm speaking from personal experience. I literally just finished IS 200 last week, which is really interesting timing. I had taken 100 a few months ago, but um, you know, it was, it was really nice. It was three and a half, four hours that we spent together uh, going through the material and being able to ask questions to uh, internal resources was was great. And, and I would also that uh, the, there are, I would just echo uh, Tom's uh, comment at, at our institution, even though we are a larger institution, we do the online um, National Incident Management System training or, or NIMS, and then we also do some in-person trainings, but those were free uh, online trainings that we've completed to serve on incident command for our university. If you go through the FEMA website, uh, all the training is, is basically for free. You know, you can use the way that you don't pace a lot of training, use the basic training. I mean, there are other trainings that probably if you coordinate with your fire department or, you know, you, uh, you know, like primarily with the emergency office of, you know, your county emergency office, sometimes they do more advanced training that sometimes it does require to be in present. But actually, especially after all these years, a lot of the training that we do, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an incident commander and as an operations section chief. And a lot yeah. of the training right now, we are doing it virtual as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. We developed an ICS teams training uh, that the National Institutes of Health is using. It's all internally done, so it's free of cost. But we've all got trained in it, and we pass on the training to our rest of the organization. And if anybody's interested in observing that, we actually have a class coming up uh, in the future. I'd be happy to uh, add you to that or you know, you can observe how that course is executed. But 
the thing is, you got to remember the hands-on component because just like anything else, you know, I always tell people you can make the analysis with the National Football League. You, you can watch the the game, you understand the rules, but until you're a player, you're really not getting the experience you need to get. So um, most of you can act as liaisons in a community for a major disaster. So if you have disaster, like think of Galveston with their hurricanes and all the labs they have there, it's it's not. You, if you understand the lingo, you can say, where's the incident command post? It's over there. And you show up and talk to liaison officer. Hey, I recommend uh, Rocky Mountain Labs. And I just want to make sure that you guys know we have our plans in effect. We're taking care of anything. And then they feel they feel confident about that you're involved and engaged. So, Thank you all so much. We are now going to actually take our lunch break. And the afternoon session will reconvene at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.